Members, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 25th of June, 2019, the Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains mm -hmm. and pay respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who may be with us today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide, direct and prosper its deliberations, to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country, at sea, on land and in the air? Thank you, members. Thank you. <laughs> members. Good evening. We have one apology tonight, Councillor Martin, who I believe is in Italy as we speak. Um, that takes us to item six, which is a confirmation of the minutes uh, of the meeting held on the 11th of June. If I could have someone move the minutes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Knoll, the seconder. Thank you, Councillor Ho. Members, any comments? If not, I'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, item seven, we have three deputations tonight. Um, the first deputation is Joyce Vandersman, who is from the Adelaide Day Centre for Homeless Persons. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have uh, five minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for having me speak to you each this evening. My name, as you heard, is Joyce Vandersman. I'm the coordinator of the Adelaide Day Centre for Homeless Persons, started by Sister Janet Mead in the 80s, in order to provide support for homeless people in the city, or indeed people in the city who find themselves isolated or marginalised for a multitude of reasons, but often that goes hand in hand with homelessness. We have a warm, welcoming, community centre and I'd love you to feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions at any stage during this little talk. We offer gardening, woodwork, cooking, crafts, handyman jobs, furniture restoring, etc, etc. It's like walking into a very warm, busy beehive when you walk into the centre and the outputs include food parcels and furniture and other supports for those in need actually supplied by the homeless people that become participants in the community centre programs. Now I'd like to give examples. One comes to mind, I'll call him Bob. 
Our soup van, which goes out every night to the squares, found Bob at Hurtle Square. He'd been sleeping in a doorway in Angus Street and he came to the van very afraid, middle-aged man, very fearful because he didn't know Adelaide very well. He obviously was suffering from a little bit of mental health problems. Well, within a day, we got him a room in a city boarding house and invited him to come to the centre during the day. And he joined in gardening, crafts. The end of the story is that he is now in a little housing trust flat. He's, his mental health has been medica medicated, but he's actually doing quite well and he's lessening his medication. He comes to us for ongoing support when he needs it. Not often. He's learning violin, he's painting, and he's being a volunteer. He feels he's got a family if and when he needs it. Look, I'd like to give more support stories because that's what keeps us going at the centre. Unfortunately, all too often in our society, you can see the visible evidence of it. People become like Bob so easily becoming homeless or isolated. We link people to whatever support that they need in order to maximise their capacity for healthy, independent living. That's a sort of a technical jargon for the way you and I would like to live. Now, it's a big challenge, especially when people are Aboriginal or they haven't got a job or a family or they're disabled or something's gone wrong, like the wife that they used to uh, have to, who made sure the bills were paid, died. That's Jimmy was a man like that, he's passed away now, but he came to us because he hadn't paid the rent since his wife died. He just didn't know how to, and he never had, he had too much pride to actually ask, so he became an alcoholic instead. You'd think that's not common sense, but he didn't actually have anyone else to just get him over that hurdle. May I now assure everybody here in this chamber that we've got a new person at our centre called Lachlan, who's really good at administration and can work efficiently with your administration because all of you through the Adelaide City Council have actually supported our work for the homeless for all these decades and it's a partnership that I hope that you choose to continue tonight. Um, we all are wanting to prevent homeless, homelessness and there's so many reasons why it's on the rise but let's be good neighbours. You haven't interrupted me to ask questions. That's, um, sorry, man, that's because we don't ask questions during deputation. Oh. So this is your chance to, to let us hear what you have to say. Okay. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And, uh, so we, uh, the second deputation we have tonight is from Mr George Chin, who's going to be talking to the uh, 2020 sponsorship of Chinatown Lunar New Year. Mr Chin. The Right Honourable uh, Lord Mayor, um, my dear councillors, and also want to acknowledge uh, members of Chinatown at the back here. Can you wear? <laughs> um, I must thank you, the Lord Mayor and the City of Adelaide, for this opportunity to address tonight's meeting. My name is George Chin. I'm the current president of Chinatown Adelaide of South Australia Incorporated, which I will refer to as CASA. CASA is a non-profit community organization as was founded in late 2003 by traders, property owners of Chinatown Precinct 
and other stakeholders in Adelaide with the primary objective of promoting recreational, cultural, social and economic activities in Chinatown to the broader community of South Australia and beyond. Since its inception 16 years ago, CASA has helped and participated in many, many major events, which has been well received and attended by local, state and foreign dignitaries, leaders and members of business and other communities. The biggest event, of course, we have been organizing every year is the Lunar New Year Street Party in Chinatown. The street party which, has, which we organized uh, for the 16th time this year is a free public event attended by people across Adelaide, South Australia and beyond and has been growing continually. Early events were held in Munta Street prior to the current day event which required the closing of Goja Street between the Central Market car park entrance and Moffat Street. The street party include live stage Chinese as well as multicultural theme art performance suitable for people of all ages and backgrounds. In this year's street party, we have over 100 market stores, provide food and privileges, retail goods, business, educational services, and a designated license area, largely promoting Australian wines and the business behind it. The entertainment program, which ran for approximately 10 hours, allowing more people to attend at a time that suits them and their families. Attendance at the street party continue to grow strongly over the years. Chinatown Adelaide is undergoing a period of reinvigoration. I know this is supported by the city of Adelaide and on behalf of CASA, I would like to thank the city of Abdale for their work and their sponsorship to us to host this Lunar University party for the last 16 years. Uh, the development proximal to Chinatown has resulted in several thousands new residents continually using the precinct and its excellent uh, ra uh, recent upgrades such as the new uh, the Chinatown Plaza food court has provided impetus to it. CASA seeks to continue the success of the street party and its range of cultural activities for the benefit of the red payers, business owners and visitors, uh, visitors to the city. The street party has received Funding allocation from the city of Adelaide of between 20,000 and 40,000 per year since 2015. Since 2015, costs associated with holding the street party have significantly increased. In 2018, it was considered essential to add and all weather covering to the main stage given the difficulty rain has caused to the audio and lighting equipment in the previous years. Road closure, sound, lighting, staging, marquee, security insurance are the large costs managed by CASA to hold the street party. Now this cost will be very difficult to meet for the February 2020 event without the desired increase in funding from the council. With a broad range of donations, supportive business and volunteers staging a consistently high quality event in 2020 and beyond, well in our respectful submission require a commitment of a total of more than 30,000 from the city of Adelaide. Mr. Chin, your time is... Okay, please assist us to keep this uh, 
to keep it there and continue to make it better. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the third deputation tonight, members, is Mr Matthew Noble, who's going to speak to us about parking restrictions in North Adelaide. Mr Noble, you have five minutes. Welcome. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak, Lord Mayor, Councillors, CEO, Senior Management of the City of Adelaide. Um, my name is Matthew Noble. I'm actually a councillor on Campbell Town Council and often spend the time sitting where you are. But this evening I'm presenting to Council as a teacher and the Director of Administration of St Dominic's Priory College, which is in North Adelaide. Here with me this evening is also our primary coordinator, uh, Kate O'Leary. I come in peace and I do understand the difficult role the council has in meeting the divergent needs of its community. Um, and I would like to provide some feedback on the decision by the City of Adelaide to impose fur further parking restrictions in North Adelaide. I'm aware that some residents have lobbied the elected members and staff to impose additional parking restrictions. And I'm aware of the issues local residents have parking close to their homes. But the issue I believe that's been ignored with these parking restrictions is that many people work in North Adelaide. When I arrive at work each weekday morning at 4, 7 a.m., the roads adjacent to our college on Molesworth Street and Barnard Street are already occupied by a large number of cars. Although some of these may be city workers who commute to the city, a large number are the doctors and nurses that work at Calvary Hospital who also struggle to find parking due to the very stringent parking restrictions around the hospital. And as such, many nurses and other shift workers park in Molesworth Street and Barnard Street, directly outside St Dominic's. Although I have no issue with the Calvary staff, this situation has resulted in almost no parking being available for the St Dominic staff on Molesworth Street and Barnard Street, and resulted in an untenable parking situation for the teachers of St Dominic's and the nurses of Calvary. The two major employers on the western side of North Adelaide are St Dominic's Priory College and Calvary Hospital. St Dominic's Priory College employs almost 100 staff, and although there are enough parks on the roads bordering the college, the three-hour parking restrictions make it almost impossible for our staff to park within a reasonable distance of their workplace. It is not feasible to ask teachers to move their cars twice a day. Teachers hardly get enough time to drink coffee and go to the bathroom during their lunch break, in which they are also required to do yard duty. People love North Adelaide because it's such a vibrant community, and St Dominic's and Calvary are part of the social fabric, both having existed in their current locations for more than 130 years. Further parking restrictions will make doing business in North Adelaide much more difficult for both of these entities and be detrimental to the local economy in North Adelaide. Where will the 100 staff at St Dominic's Park? There's almost no alternative parking within a reasonable distance of the school. And although I'm arguing for no increase in parking restrictions, a possible solution that would at least partly alleviate the parking issues would be to provide unrestricted parking along the golf links on Mills Terrace on the western side of the road. Now we've been informed by council staff that the proposed restrictions on Mills Terrace are to make provision for people wishing to use the tennis courts. The problem with that argument is that I've never seen anyone using those tennis courts on a weekday. And even if they did, they could park in the three hour zone on the other side of Mills Terrace. Um, in addition to this, I consider it an essential requirement that the teachers of St Dominic's have access to parking permits to overstay the three hour limits, and that is to be implemented prior to the implementation of the parking restrictions. Now, during the week, I've had some correspondence and discussions with Councillor Philip Budd. I'm disappointed he's not here this evening. He indicated that some of our issues may be overcome through a parking permit scheme for local workers and that the administration of the City of Adelaide is planning to implement this later in the year. I'm requesting that Council should consider a motion without notice, I know it's part of your agenda, that to do that. And the motion should be something like this. So to further implementing further parking restrictions in the western section of North Adelaide until a parking permit system is implemented for local residents and the local workers of Calvary and St Dominic's. I consider that this would not breach your meeting procedures in that the CEO, Lord Mayor and relevant councillors did receive notice as a letter from me about a week ago outlining this issue and a request to give this deputation on the topic. Given that St Dominic's and the Dominican Sisters have been in North Adelaide since 1883, more than 100 years prior to most residents, I think that our school and staff need to be shown more consideration by the City of Adelaide. 
I would like the City of Adelaide to believe in us and make our job of educating the next generation of young women easier and not place increased obstacles in place for our teachers to do their job. Thank you for listening to my deputation. Uh, I hear from the last ones that you not, don't take questions, but I would certainly like to be able to provide answers to your questions you might have. Thank you for your deputation, Mr Noble. Thank you. Members, that takes us to uh, item eight on the agenda. Uh, 8.1 is a petition to improve uh, improvement to cycle safety at the traffic light controlled intersection of North Terrace and George Street. If I could have someone move, thank you, Councillor Sims, to accept the petition. And a seconder, Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Sims, uh, there's no comment. So um, members, if I can uh, go to the vote that the petition be accepted, those in favour? Those against, thank you, that is carried. <coughs> so, members, we'll go to the recommendations of the committee um, and advice from the Adelaide Parklands Authority. Um, so I'll take them one at a time. The first is recommendation one, unowned and semi-owned cat management. If I could have someone move. You meant, thank you, Councillor Moran, seconder. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak to it? No, Lord Mayor. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members? Councillor Moran? Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Recommendation two is the Sustainability Incentive Scheme Review. Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder? Councillor Ho. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Ho. Members? Councillor Sims. Oh, sorry, I was voting. Summed up. Summed up. Summed up. Members to the vote. Those in favour. Those against. Thank you. That is carried. Recommendation three. Um, I'm actually going to take the, this in parts um, because um, myself and Councillor. Kuros uh, will be pulled out in different sections. So, members, if I could actually ask that we move sections one and four, and then I'll go to sections two and three separately. Sorry, Lord Mayor, is this item 4.4 you're referring to? No, item uh, recommendation three, which is the events and festival uh, sponsorship program. Recommendation three. on the committee agenda. Sorry, sorry, yes, I'm looking at the agenda for tonight's meeting. I thought I was too. It's marked as sorry. 4.3 yeah, 4.3 recommendation three. I've got uh, item 9.1 recommendation three. Uh, yes, thanks, Colin. Sorry, through the presiding member, um, 4.3 was an item that was actually considered under the items for discussion. So there wasn't actually a 4.3 on the committee agenda, if you remember, it was just tabled there. So what you're looking at now is recommendation three, but it was item 4.4 on the committee right. agenda. Yeah. Sorry, Lord <laughs> Mayor. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks for that explanation. Hey, Councillor Kouros. Do you want me to declare which item? Um, so item 2.1, um, I have a material conflict of interest and I will vacate the room when this item is called up. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Um, I have the same material, co uh, material conflict for item three of that recommendation. Um, and at that, when we get to that, I'll leave the room and ask the Deputy Lord Mayor to take over the chair. So members, if I could have a mover for um, uh, recommendation three, item one and item four. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Seconder, members? Councillor Knoll, Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Sims, members? No, if not, go back to Councillor Sims. No, no. Thank you. Uh, members, those in favour? <coughs> those against? So section one and or item one and four are carried. Um, I'll now go to item two within recommendation three, uh, which is the approval of the Adelaide Horse Trials Management. Just 
wait for Councillor Kouros to leave the room. Uh, so we have art, uh, section two, sorry, which is the uh, funding for the Adelaide Horse Trials Management. Um, if I could have a mover. Thank you, Councillor Moran. A seconder. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak to it? No. Councillor Hyde? No, if I could have members. Sorry, Councillor Moran. Thank you. Uh, those in favour? Those against? Oh, that is carried. Um, that takes us to section three of recommendation three. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, if I could ask you to take the chair and we'll get Councillor Moran. Um, members, I have a material conflict of interest as I am on the board of the Festival Corporation, Festival Trust and the Film Festival. Thank you. If I, can have a, if I can have a mover, thank you, Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Moran. Any discussion or debate? Councillor Sims to sum up. Summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. I'll ask the Lord Mayor to come back to So that takes us to recommendation four on tonight's agenda, which is the annual review of delegations. I look to floor members. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Second to Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? No. Councillor Moran? No. Members? No. Councillor Sims? No. Thank you. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Recommendation five on tonight's agenda is the 2019-2020 Integrated Business Plan, the review of general operations fees and charges. Look to the floor for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Seconder, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Knoll, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Kouros, members? No, Councillor Knoll to sum up. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Recommendation six, the Rundle Mall Management Authority 2019-2020 Business Plan and Budget. I look to the floor. Thank you, Councillor Abrahimzade. Seconder, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Abrahimzade. Councillor Kouros. No. Members? Councillor Abrahimzade. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, recommendation seven is the Adelaide Central Market Authority 2019-2020 Business Plan and Budget. Members look to the floor. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Saying to Councillor Kouros. Councillor Sims. No, Councillor Kouros. No. Members. No, Councillor Sims. Sorry. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. That takes us to recommendation eight, uh, which is the adoption of the 2019-20 integrated business plan. Rudy, did you want to just make a comment around um, conflicts of interest on this item? Thank you, through the Lord Mayor. Um, just clarifying for the members in the room that um, there is a specific exemption under the variation of regulations that relates to the adoption of the budget which means that no conflicts of interest are applicable tonight for this particular item just because of that exemption under the legislation. So just to clarify. Thank you. Members, I look to the floor. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. A seconder. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Kouros. No. no. Members? If not, back to the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, members. Are those in favour? Those against, that is carried. 
Uh, recommendation nine is the adoption of valuations for 2019-2020. To the floor. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Seconded, Councillor Kouros. Members, oh, sorry, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Kouros. Members, back to the mover. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Recommendation 10 is the declaration of rates for 2019-2020. To the floor. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Seconded, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Moran? No, thank you. Councillor Kouros? Members? Back to the mover. Thank you. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Recommendation 11 is the declaration of Rundle Mall separate rates 2019-2020. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Seconder, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Moran. Uh, don't Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Members. Councillor Moran. Thank you, members. Those in favour. Those against. That is carried. <laughs> Um, and the last recommendation from committee is the uh, 1920, sorry, 19, 2019 2020 grant recommendations for community development, arts and culture, recreation and sport. There is an amendment on the screen um, to the. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Um, Sorry, Councillor Sims, are you? I oh, just wanted to move the uh, move that as amended, but to give an explanation for the amendment. Thank you. I'll just wait for a seconder. Thank you, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Just to clarify, um, the members, we discussed this uh, last um, week at the committee. Um, you would recall that I proposed that the funding for the day centre come from quick, uh, quick grants, quick response. Um, that was an error. Um, it was meant to come from the community development grants, um, so I apologise for the confusion. I've been advised by administration that the quick response grants isn't the right funding pool for the money to come from, um, so this is the appropriate place for it to come from. Um, we've obviously heard a deputation from uh, Joyce tonight about the good work um, that the day centre does. Um, and uh, I've visited the centre before my, myself. I know Councillor Amber Amber has been there as well, um, as have many other councillors, um, and uh, they really make a, a great contribution to our city in terms of helping vulnerable people. I noted um, Joyce's comment that she will engage with administration as well to ensure that uh, they meet um, administration's criteria going forward in years two and three. So I, I commend the motion. Uh, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Did you wish to speak? Uh, uh, members, do you wish to speak to the motion? If not, Councillor Sims to sum up. Thank you, members to the floor. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Members, that takes us to item 9.2, which is the advice of the Adelaide Parklands Authority. If I look to the floor, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, and seconder, uh, Councillor Kouros. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Kouros, members. Uh, back to the Deputy Lord Mayor. Well done. Members, those in favour, those against, that is carried. 9.3, the recommendations of the Strategic Planning and Development Policy Committee, the special meeting that was held just prior to uh, Council tonight. Um, the Recommendation is on the screen. Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder, Councillor Kouros. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? At all? Apologies, there's three recommendations coming through, so we'll just do them one at a time so that everybody has a chance to read the recommendations on the screen. Um, Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak to it? Members? Deputy Lord Mayor. I may flag an amendment, Lord Mayor, if that's okay. To this one, yes. Um, just to add, um, express concern. Is that as, as point three? Uh, yes, three. 
or that could be within the I'm happy to take advice from administration on this. I've spoken earlier about it through the CEO to Shanti Ditto. Uh, so I'm being told it's recommendation two that you were going to make an amendment, not recommendation one. Yeah. Okay, so we're just doing recommendation one at the moment. Sorry. Oh yes, I apologise. It's recommendation two, correct. Yeah. Thank you. So recommendation one. <laughs> Did you wish to speak to it, Deputy Lord Mayor? Thank no. Sorry. Uh, back to the Murder Council since. Okay, so those in favour of recommendation one from the special meeting, thank you, that is carried. We'll now go to recommendation two, which is on the screen. Mm, there it is. No? That's great. So, so, thank you. Um, I'm actually. So, Deputy Lord Mayor, are you moving that as an alternate recommendation? If you are moving this, sorry, Lord Mayor, are you moving this initially as is, and then you're asking me to move an alternate? Or no, I'm moving this as an alternate recommendation. As is, yes. As With is. Two point four, as currently amended and read. Okay. Um, members look for a seconder. Councillor Hyde. Members. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. But just briefly, uh, thank you for the advice and feedback. I think there's been a great amount of reform done through this piece of work. Um, I still have some concerns. I probably would like to see that flush out a little bit more over the next um, few months, especially on how this potentially can be applied. I think to reserve the right of power direction to a single minister of heritage in determining, um, obviously, saving heritage is very important, but also. The flip side of that means the minister has the power to potentially uh, disallow a decision of a panel and override it to demolish heritage as well. Uh, so look, I'll be really interested to see how the application of this will transpire. I can see benefits from a protection perspective, but I also see some threats with regards to how this can be used um, to, um, in essence, to hinder any support or conservative uh, or conservation of heritage as well. So, uh, like I said, it's, sort of, it's up in the air a bit for me at the moment, but I think I'd like to express concerns because I didn't see that there was enough information in the document to explain, I guess, how that power of direction will play out. Uh, but I will watch it very closely in the next uh, few months to see how its application is going to pan out specifically. Uh, and if we get any advice from the government, then potentially that concern can be then waived uh, and not supported. But for now, I think it's important that we state that we do have a concern um, in just. Um, really to, have to give the minister the full powers to be able to direct on matters of heritage. Uh, Councillor Hyde, then Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would um, echo the Deputy Lord Mayor's um, concerns and just add to that, as I highlighted um, earlier in this committee, that in a state where uh, donations to political parties from developers are not banned, um, I do think uh, that there is a there is a certain higher onus that we need to place um, on the power that we give ministers. Now, I know the current minister for the Her for heritage is, is a huge supporter um, of our built heritage, both in the city and, and across the state. But um, this is about a uh, power that will be given not just to this minister, but to other ministers um, that come after him. So uh, I think we need to be really careful uh, about doing that, and uh, I'd like to see a check placed on that power. Councillor Sings? No? Members? No, if not, go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor. Okay, members, uh, those in favour? Those against? That's carried. And we have oh, one final recommendation. Uh, so I'll look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder? <laughs> Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? No, Councillor Moran. Members? Councillor Sims, thank you. Uh, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, that takes me to uh, my report, item 10. Um, so recently we celebrated the uh, City Place brand launch at the Adelaide Town Hall, Designed for Life, uh, which is a key pillar in telling Adelaide's unique livability story in support of our residential and economic growth agenda. And uh, I thank those of you that were able to attend, um, and I look forward to being rolled out. It's been um, a very busy month with many events, including the opening of the 2019 
uh, Adelaide Wine Festival and the second China Australia Wine and Spirit Forum, um, uh, with uh, which I uh, attended the opening of that, uh, plus the keynotes for the Governance Institute of Australia Governance and Risk Management Forum and the National Heritage Tourism Conference, which was held here at the um, Adelaide Town Hall. Um, I also spoke at the launch of the program for Umbrella Winter City Sounds Festival, um, which uh, looked an, like an amazing program, and also the official unveiling of the UNESCO City of Music Public Artwork, uh, which is the wall just near the uh, Morford Street Bridge, um, which was funded by council. Um, so you do take a drive past there. Uh, it's a massive piece of public art, and um, they've done an amazing job. Um, I was invited to take part in panel discussions for the CEDA South Australian Arts Plan and the New Mayor's Forum hosted by the Australian Institute of Urban Studies for the SA chapter. I also hosted a Lord Mayor reception for the South Australian History Fit, uh, Festival which incorporated the History Trust of South Australia Awards and also uh, to welcome Alison Hewitt and Dr um, Elsa Turnick who are the thinkers in residence for the City of Adelaide. Um, excellent discussions were had at my uh, Lord Mayor Defence Industry Business Roundtable and again I thank the members that were able to attend. And last night um, at the Lord Mayor's uh, resident uh, group gathering and again thanks to those members who were able to join me. Um, Council recently hosted an information workshop for events organisers and vendors where I had the pleasure of discussing the aims and benefits of the sustainable events guidelines as well as the extensive positive feedback from events which have implemented them already. Um, last week we welcomed uh, 500 delegates of the Perfect China Incentive Tourism Group to Adelaide, the organisation's second year visiting and uh, in great news for the city, Perfect China committed to bring additional groups in 2020 and 2021. Refugee Week was celebrated last week and I attended the reception at Government House and a culture through food event at the Adelaide Central Markets. I also attended the Aboriginal Veterans Commemorative Service as part of Reconciliation Week, um, the Sir Ross Smith Commemoration Ceremony at St Peter's Cathedral as part of the Epic Flight Centenary, as well as the Government House reception in honour of the birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. Um, I do thank uh, the members who attended functions on my, on my behalf uh, in the last month. It's been a pretty busy schedule um, and it's great to see everybody getting out and about. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge that the Pel uh, Pelsa Park, Pitya oh Rilla, sorry, Pitya Rilla um, Park 19, which I know as Marshmallow Park, and I think I'll always think of it as Marshmallow Park. Um, the Activity Hub recently took two awards at the Parks and Leisure Australia's NT, uh, South Australian Northern Terry Awards of Excellence, including Park of the Year Award and Place Based Award greater than 500,000. The project was a collaborative effort delivered by the City of Adelaide, the Government of South Australia, Aspect Studios and LCS Landscape <coughs> Proprietary Limited. And the project now goes forward to the national awards, which will be held in Perth in October. So congratulations to all of those who uh, partook in the development of that park. It's a great board. Thank you, members. Um, could I have someone please move that back before being adopted? Thank you, uh, Councillor Abrazim, today, and seconder. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, those in favour? Thank you. That is carried. That takes us to item 11, which is the council reports, uh, reports from council members. If I could have a mover. Thank you, Councillor Moran. And the second to Councillor Knoll. I saw your hand go up. Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Knoll. Members, are there any comments that you wish to make of the contents at all? No, if not, go back to the mover, Councillor Moran. Thank you, uh, members. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Item 12 on the agenda tonight. We have three items. 12.1 is the quarterly forward procurement report. I look for a um, uh, move from the chamber. Members? Thank you, Councillor Sims. And a seconder, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Knoll. Members? 
No, Councillor Sims. Uh, members, those in favour of 12.1, those against, thank you, that is carried. Uh, item 12.2 is the appointment of committee deputy chairs. Um, so the first I'll do is procedural. I'll actually ask for someone to, to move and second, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. And seconder, so Councillor Knoll. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to it at all? Thank you, no procedural, Mr Knoll. Members, back to the mover. Those in favour, those against, that's carried. We'll now go to um, nominations. So we're looking to nominate a deputy chair to preside, we'll do it in two parts. The first one uh, to preside for the committee, uh, the dates as proposed. Thank you, proposed. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you have a nomination? Uh, are you taking two nominations or just one for the committee? Uh, I'm taking two nominations for the committee. Sorry, you're taking one nomination for the committee, one nomination for the strategic uh, planning and development policy. Committee. Well, we can do it in four or we can do it in two. So it's however the floor would like to do it. Do it in two. So I'd like to nominate for the committee, Councillor Helen Donovan as the Deputy Chair of the Council's Committee. And as the Deputy Chair for Strategic Planning and Development Policy Committee, I'd like to nominate Councillor Abraham Okay, Members. My understanding you're nominating for the whole period, so the two periods that are in the item? Both lots of six months. Um, do I have a seconder? Thank you. So I'd need a seconder for that first. So Councillor Hyde. So Councillor Moran. I'd like to nominate um, for the Deputy Chair in the absence of the Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Is that for the whole period, Councillor Moran? Yes. All right. Is that just for the first one and not for the second? Not for the second one. Just for the first one. Members, are there any more nominations? So I'll go back to the nominees. So um, Councillor Donovan, are you happy to accept that nomination? Uh, Councillor Abraham, are you happy to accept that nomination? Um, Councillor Sims, are you happy to accept that nomination? Sorry, Lord Mayor, I'm a bit confused. Are we doing uh, this in for periods 1 to July to 31st of December? Are we doing it in sections or are we doing it for the full period? Um, we're doing it for the full period. Okay. All right. Look, in that case, I'm happy to withdraw. Uh, we can do it, but the nomination that came forward was for the full period. Yeah, so if you want to do it in six months, we can do it in six months. If, if people are open to that, that could be a solution if we have two people that have nominated. Oh. Okay. So members, I'm, I'm getting nods everywhere, so well, just, I'll just try to capture that. Now, I've already moved for the full period uh, already, so do you want me to change my motion? Is that what you'd like to do? Your nomination. My nomination. Um, <laughs> so if you're happy for Councillor Donovan for the first six months, Councillor Sims for the second six months? Sure. For the committee? Yep. And then we have one nomination for the Strategic Planning and Development Committee, which is Councillor Abrams. Abraham today. Yep, for the first six months and then for the second six months, I'm happy to nominate Councillor Gnoll. So members, first of all, Councillor Abraham said, are you happy to yes. accept that Councillor Gnoll? Councillor Sims, great. Um, so the nominations we have in for the first section for the period of 1 July 2019 to 31 December 2019 is Councillor Helen Donovan. Um, there's no remuneration, so there's no conflict of interest for this one. Um, I'll do it all together. Um, for the second uh, period from the 1st of January 2020 to the 30th of June 2020, I have one nomination, which is Councillor Sims. For the uh, point two, which is the Deputy Chair for the Strategic Planning and Development Policy Committee, for the first period from the 1st of July 2019 to the 31st of December 2019, I have one nomination, which is Councillor Abraham today. And for the second period, which is from the 1st of January 2020 to the 30th of June 2020, I have Councillor Knoll. If there are no more nominations. 
So I'll seek a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, and a seconder. Councillor Kouros. Members, if not, we'll go uh, Councillor Deputy Lord Mayor, sorry, to sum up. Uh, okay, go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Congratulations, councillors. Thanks, members. I just want to make sure we captured that. Um, we have 12.3, which is progress of motion by elected members. Look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Donovan, and a seconder, Councillor Moran. Uh, members, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Questions on notice, item 13. Questions on notice? No questions on notice. Questions without notice. Members, are there any questions without notice? No. Uh, that takes us to item 15 on the agenda. Um, now, because we do have um, several members in the gallery, motion uh, with your permission, members, I might bring item 15.9 to the top of item 15, so we can actually do the China Town New Year's. Is everybody okay with that? Show of hands, nods, everything? Great, thank you. Um, so we'll go to uh, Councillor Ho, 15.9, motion on notice for 2020 Chinatown Lunar New Year. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to move my motion as printed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Chinatown Lunar New Year Street Party is one of the biggest multicultural events in Adelaide. The purpose of this event is to celebrate Chinese New Year and also promote Asian cultures to the wider community and to explore the cultural diversity. Also, it provides information on the contributions that different cultural groups have made to the development of South Australian society. Chinatown Adelaide of South Australia, known as CASA, has organized this Lunar New Year Street Party event since 2004. With only a few hundred people attending to it, and it seems grow to attract more than 30,000 people coming in to the 2019 Lunar New Year's trip party. I, my, myself, and the Lord Mayor, as well as some other members, have attended this event. From the committee meeting last week, we know that CASA has applied $50,000 for this event, whereas the admin has only approved $15,000 from our sponsorship budget. This event will cost $167,000 and the state government is likely to fund $30,000. The amount of funding from the city of Adelaide in the past few years were $30,000 for 2014, $20,000 for 2015, 16, 17, and all of a sudden $40,000 for 2018, and last year it was $30,000. According to our admin, CASA's application, only rated 18 out of 100, which is the lowest rating application, which I am not surprised why our admin only approved less than one third of what CASA asked for. However, to those people who have attended this event before, we all know that this is a very good event and I can, I can give you my 100% guarantee that this is the most important event for the local Chinese community. You will not be able to find any South Australian Chinese who have never attended this event before. Indeed, most of us would love to attend to this event while we are in Adelaide. This event is not just for the local Chinese community, but also enjoyed by many other communities as well. Members, I believe most of you have attended this event before, and you know that how good it is. CASA is run by volunteers, and none of those people understand how to write professional applications, and none of those people really understand our government structure and how we actually allocate our budgets. All they want is to better organize this event for the local community to enjoy, and it's very important for the diversity of our culture, and it gives our ratepayers in the Chinatown prison a lot of benefits. Members, especially those who claim that you work tirelessly 
for the local Chinese community. Can you please support my motion? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ho. Deputy Lord Mayor. Just briefly, um, in July 2018, we had a similar issue uh, to do with funding with regards to CASA and the Chinese New Year in the city, where I believe we moved the motion and the Chamber Council endorsed for us to increase the level of funding, which came from a separate pool of money. But also a separate part of the motion talked about the administrative, potential administrative support to the organising committee in being able to establish, um, I guess, a, a, high, a better ranked um, a better ranked event application or potentially look at other opportunities where they can improve uh, as part of their application or part of the event. So I think the first question there is for administration. Um, with such an important event for the Chinese community and a multicultural calendar in South Australia, and given that in 2018 the Council's already endorsed the position of improved funding uh, and also looking at ways to support them to improve the event and the quality of the event, uh, what have we done in the last 12 months uh, for us to do that from an administrative perspective, given that it's Council's position? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, what opportunities do we have as a Council to continue supporting this event and grow this event as part of our multicultural calendar um, for the years to come without having them continuously having to come to Council? And I remember we've done We've moved the motion on the floor of council every year for the last six years to increase funding for the China Chinatown uh, New Year's celebration. What do we need to do to make sure that we continue supporting this event? And if they're not meeting the criteria they need to meet, how can we help them to meet the criteria that we need to meet to ensure that the event remains successful uh, and to remain uh, well funded? CEO. Uh, thank you, um, Lord Mayor, through the Chair. If I could just make a comment and I might ask Ian just to flesh out what we have done uh, throughout the year. Um, I know in the past uh, the type of support that we've been providing has been in relation to road closures um, and making sure um, that CASA um, has the paperwork and the skills to be able to make their event as smooth as possible. Um, and But I'll pass over to Ian just to um, expand on that. Um, in answer to your second part of the question, um, Paula last week at committee did talk to the fact that we need to look at our, um, how we fund multicultural events. Under our um, arts and culture grants, there's a cap of um, only $8,000. Um, for those um, multicultural events. So there's a sort of funding limit between major sponsorship, which um, gets funded through um, sponsorship, and then the multicultural events. So we need to do a piece of work um, to help uh, flesh out um, what we could do to improve the gap that's occurring between major sponsorship and multicultural events. But um, Ian, if you could just comment on that first part, please. Um, through the Lord Mayor, thank you for the question. Yeah, look, it, it is a, it's a really challenging environment. Appreciate that. It's a heavily oversubscribed uh, fund. We've had $3.2 million in for $1.7 million of available funding. Um, and we've certainly looked at ways to be a bit more flexible, and we've looked at ways of utilising other parts of administration to support it, whether that's particularly our international activity, which does relate to this event, um, given um, we've heard about new skin and other incentive groups, uh, particularly Chinese incentive groups that come through that do add vibrancy, hotel nights, and a whole range of benefits to the city. I know Paula uh, does work as close as she possibly can with you know, the, the literally hundreds of applications for these events. I'm happy to have another look at that. I'm very conscious of Councillor Ho's also some previous conversations around how we can help different groups address what can be a bureaucratic and daunting process for them. So I fully understand that's some, some extra work that we would need to keep doing. Well, just to making a brief comment, uh, if that's okay. Uh, look, I think the Council, uh, through its last seven or eight years endorsing this event, really goes to show how serious we take the event in the city. And I've got to say, since I've been elected in 2010, I've pretty much attended every single one of these events. And it is growing strength to strength, and it is improving. And we need to be mindful that this is, uh, like most of the other events that we do support as well, they're volunteers-led. Um, I would like to see an opportunity where we do discuss this at a future workshop uh, or potentially budget consideration where we can look at elevating uh, this specific event and improving it to potentially getting it to be a tourism event and maybe to give it a strategic partnership status instead of a sponsorship status. I think if we head down that path, provided that the Chinese community can also step up 
uh, to take on the challenge and to be able to fulfil their obligations under a strategic partnership, then council could look at this in a different lens and use a different funding criteria to take it out of the sponsorship fund to a strategic partnership fund. But I think there should be an opportunity for us to discuss this, provided they meet targets around tourism, uh, targets around activation, visitation, and a whole heap of things that need to be considered. Uh, I'm personally open to that. So if there's an opportunity to discuss this over the next 12 months in the lead up to the next budget, I think that would give them security over a three year tenure to grow the event instead of having to come in every year asking for more money and not knowing if next year they've got the same level of cash to be able to improve the event moving forward. So I think elevating that discussion will probably give the community certainty and also give them the opportunity to plan forward, which at the moment they can't do. Okay, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, members, would anybody else like to speak to this item? If not, Councillor Ho, I was wondering whether I could suggest... Oh, sorry, Councillor Knoll. <laughs> Too close. Um, and just to put a couple of words to support uh, both uh, Councillor Hose and the Deputy Lord Mayor's words. And I mean, this is a significant cultural event. And I think being from that precinct, it is certainly something that we look forward to. And it is it is certainly that uh, reflects the mix of the community in that area. I think it also, you know, the highlighting of the fact that we do need to do something a little bit with the ethnic community a little bit differently, simply because uh, they don't necessarily fit into those uh, uh, large posts, you know, more commercial, commercially orientated uh, Sort of events and, and it does reflect more about the uh, grassroots community being involved so i think it is important that we we do help assist in that and also that we are that hub that these people uh, and these uh, groups can come to and uh, you know celebrate their events and that within the city and um, you know i just think it's important that we we uh, do embrace that because we do want every new next generation of, uh, of visitors and, and uh, immigrants that you know, to be able to use the city as their as their base and the place that they feel comfortable Thank you, Councillor Connell. Um, members, if there's no other speakers, um, Councillor Ho, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps look at a, a very small variation to your um, motion, and that would be that after the word funded, um, that it says through our sponsorship program, out of any savings identified as, as is. And the reason I ask that is because last year, um, members, those that were here, we funded part through our sponsorship program and the other part came through um, economic development team. And what I'd prefer is if the funding comes through one, one funding or one grant program, then next year the information we have is how much in total it got funded and that it's actually embedded in the grants program, then one part coming from here and one part coming from there. It's a, a, a bit of an administrative call, but if you're happy to accept that as a... Uh, just a question, Lord Mayor. Now, like, uh, may I ask the admin whether or not they have got enough money in the sponsorship program fund? They don't, but this is actually to come from savings through the QF1 budget review. Right. Then so it doesn't, I'm happy it doesn't, it doesn't it. change where it comes from, so it's not um, changing what's in the sponsorship budget that's just been passed in the budget. This is actually so that when it comes through, it's added to the sponsorship money. All right, thank you so much. Are you, so are you happy to accept yeah, this variation? Uh, so members, is everybody happy to accept that? Yeah, good. I'll go, Deputy Lord Mayor. No, sorry. You're happy. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm actually just trying to get to, back to Councillor Ho to sum up. Councillor Ho, would you like to sum up? Sum up. Thank you, members. Those in favour? Those against? That's carried. <laughs> Thank you. Um, members, that takes us back to 15.1. Uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I move that Council requests administration investigate the potential to trial in-ground pedestrian crossing lights in Adelaide, similar to that used in Sydney and Melbourne, and provide advice on potential costs and locations. I'll look for a second at Councillor Moran. Did I, was, yep, sorry, just to find you. Sorry. That's all right. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I won't speak on this for long, Lord Mayor, because I think it's fairly uh, self-explanatory. I have um, spoken to most members about this at different times over the last few weeks. 
This is a technology that's been uh, trialled in Sydney and over in Melbourne. I understand that in Sydney they've decided not to proceed beyond a trial, um, but I think in Melbourne they're still looking at it. This is new technology that lights up um, footpaths as a form of uh, traffic signalling. Um, and um, its main intention is to improve pedestrian safety. Um, Members have often argued that I should take more of an interest in core business of the council, rubbish and roads. I've taken that on board, Lord Mayor. Um, so there'll be a few motions uh, coming from me tonight on, um, on those very important, very important issues. Um, but look, I know that some members in the community may well say that why on earth are we even looking at this if people are not being attentive crossing the road or are too engaged with their um, mobile devices, you know, that's their problem. Um, and look, I can certainly understand that argument, but at the same time, I take a very pragmatic view when it comes to public safety. And I think if this is a measure that works, then we really should be um, looking at it. I just want to remind members, this is simply an investigation. Um, it's uh, asking for some information about the costs, um, potential locations, and of course, I'm sure that uh, should this get the green light, uh, any um, investigation done by administration would be informed by the experience interstate as well. Um, so really, I, I ask members to support this. If administration conducts the investigation and they come back and say, look, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze here, this isn't worth us investing the money and there are other ways that we can improve pedestrian safety, then, you know, that's, um, that's fine. But I'd really like to look at this. I also think it, it's a fundamental question too about how we ensure that our streets are more pedestrian friendly, move away from the cold of the car and recognise that they need to uh, encourage free flow and free movement of people. And this is just one way of doing that. I also point out, I think they look quite attractive too. So um, it could be a great way to light up some parts of our city. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Moran. I reserve my life, right? Members, Councillor Hyde, then Councillor High. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and I can commend Councillor Sims for taking on board that feedback. Um, uh, one of the motions he's bringing today I will support, but this one is one that I cannot support, um, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to save administration and Councillor Sims the trouble of this investigation by highlighting that we've seen a failed trial interstate, um, a very costly trial, $260,000. Um, we've seen one rolled out uh, in the city of Melbourne, um, which was uh, supposedly going to cost $120,000 um, uh, to trial it. It ended up costing $280,000, which is a massive, uh, a massive blowout there. Um, uh, this, this seems, this seems, and noting that it was reported that the state government had spoken to uh, the council about it. This certainly seems like um, uh, a discussion that uh, that some people at a department departmental level uh, might like to have. Um, uh, but certainly, I would like to knock it on its head um, uh, because we've seen one failed trial. We'll probably see another failed trial. I'm not interested in us throwing good money after bad where the work's already been done um, interstate on this matter. But. But moreover, moreover, there's a concern here, um, and, and I'm very concerned about what is happening to society. Are we so infantilised um, uh, that the government um, needs to take care of you to this degree uh, to show you when to and when not to cross a road? I mean, I, I can't speak for everyone in this chamber, but certainly one of the first things I learned to do was tie my shoe shoelaces. The thing after that I learned to do was how to cross the road safely. You look both ways, you see that it's clear of traffic um, uh, and then you cross. So I, I don't think we need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and then potentially millions of dollars thereafter uh, mollycoddling uh, pedestrians in the city. I, I think we need to say to people um, that they just need to simply take more care um, when they're at intersections, be aware when you're crossing the road. Um, I think they would be better for it, um, and certainly our budget would be better for it as well. Thank you. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, I do not support this motion as well for the following three reasons. Firstly, it would just encourage more people to become like the phone zoom phone zombies that they're really looking at their phones and not even aware that what is surrounding them at all time and we should not encourage this kind of behavior and second according to the reports from other states 
experts have experts advise that it is just waste of money. Then why should we spend our money on this? Last but not least, we have a very limited budget and there are a lot more other important things that we should take care of. Every single investigation will cost us. If we already know that we're not going to have a good product, then why bother to spend money on it? Thank you. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've got a question off administration. Um, now, Councillor Sims mentioned that there was a trial happening in, in Sydney. That's Melbourne. Uh, in Melbourne, yeah. okay. Um, so I guess to, to save ourselves some headache, are we able to go to these capital city councils, both in Melbourne and Sydney, tap them on the shoulder and get their report rather than us doing the work, seeing what worked for them, what didn't work for them? Um, I don't know whether if, uh, whether if something like this uh, would be, uh, would be, um, uh, I guess, uh, our responsibility. I see this more, uh, more of a, of a deputy thing. But um, I yeah, just wanted to to get some answers on that. See whether if um, we've had any conversations. Um, if I could ask Clinton to please clarify. Thank you. Thank you, three Lord Mayor. Um, before we conduct any trial, we would have to do that sort of investigation. Um, we would have to speak to those that have undertaken the trials in Melbourne and Sydney, um, our department, state government department for planning, transport and infrastructure have already had some of those discussions and it's certainly um, within their delegations under the Road Traffic Act to ensure that whatever um, process was trialled was safe for pedestrians and vehicles. So yes, we would have to go through that process in detail. Members, other questions? Councillor Donovan. Given the feedback that we've heard so far, and given uh, one trial so far has had some feedback, what about if we look at a, an amendment that says something to the effect of the council requests administration to investigate the potential to trial in-ground pedestrian crossing lights pending the results from the other trials uh, or pending the success of the other trials so that we're essentially putting this on hold until we know what the outcomes of the other trials are then if, they're, if they are failed then we know not to proceed. So, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Hyde. If I put that amendment forward. Um, Councillor Sims, are you happy for that? I'm variation to that, your yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Pending yeah. Yeah. The other. And Councillor Moran is a second. That way we don't need to do the any investigation if there is no no outcome that suggests that it's going to be worthwhile. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. So I'll just wait until it's written and then I'll get the meeting to approve that variation. Is that correct? Is that the intention? Maybe if we remove Sydney, since we already know the outcome of that, and just say pending the success of, tri of trials in Melbourne and provide advice on potential costs and locations. So only should it be successful with the investigation we proceed. So, so I need to leave the meeting to accept the variation meeting. So by a show of hands, we're accepting the variation. So that. No. Can I ask a question so, before before accepting a variation? Uh, no. no. So if, this, if, if it's not done as a variation, it can be moved as an amendment or we can go back to the original. So as an, a variation to the original motion, it hasn't been accepted. So can I just move it as an amendment? You can move it as an amendment. Seconder, so I need a seconder for that amendment. Um, you can't. I need someone else to move the amendment, second the amendment. 
No second, that's not, lapses, and that goes back to the original motion. Okay, so the original motion will come back in a minute. Did anybody else? Yeah, I was happy to second the first debate. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, come on, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, you have already spoken, Alex. Sorry, Councillor Hyde, you've already spoken. Anyone else? But I haven't spoken. I'm going to second for the first. I've, I've asked a question, I haven't spoken to this. Okay. I didn't have a question. Okay, so we have a seconder. So, so we've now got an amendment by Councillor Donovan and a seconder in Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Donovan. I think I explained the purpose of the amendment is simply to put this on pause, on hold, until such time as we actually have any evidence of, of its success. Should there be evidence of the success of the trial, then it becomes worth investigating. Still, of course, considering that it will be pending um, further consideration in terms of the costings. And certainly, as has been alluded to, if there are more cost-effective ways of us doing this work, then of course, I'm sure we would receive that information back from Council, given, from Council Admin, given the conversations have already commenced as indicated by the administrative uh, comment, I see no downside to awaiting further information and including this um, within the conversations that are already taking place so it doesn't appear to be any additional burden on administration, which we would, of course, always look to minimise. I had Councillor Hyde next. Oh, sorry, Councillor Abraham, did you want to speak to it? Councillor Hyde? Um. I'm seconding this motion, aren't I? No. no, no, no. Oh, oh, my, my anyway, regardless, my, my question um, uh, to administration is, uh, regardless of the outcome of this motion, will you undertake to get hold of uh, Sydney's uh, completed trial, anything that you can get hold of them, and also touch base with Melbourne and see what you can get out of them as well? I'd like to see it anyway. Is it hard to get hold of? <laughs> no, I don't actually really want to progress this, but I might still be keen to Why say that. <laughs> Just give the undertaking yes or no. That's all I want. That is ridiculous. doesn't get it. So, um, I will ask the question of administration. So, Councillor Hyde has said if the motion fails, can they still get the information from the um, trial? Thank you, Clinton. Can you confirm? Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think as we've um, provided our administration comment to this motion, some of those discussions with uh, DIPTI have already started. Um, we're always on the lookout for new technologies. Um, I would have thought part of our business as usual would be to obtain some information about those uh, trials that are being undertaken. But the question is, if this fails, will you still get hold of those reports? And, and for the benefit of members, I have other things that I would be interested in looking at, not this. Admin trick. Uh, yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, uh, we could make those reports available as part of council business. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Sims and then Councillor Moran. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'm perplexed by this new principle of um, asking for evidence after voting against a motion to... Uh, I would have thought that what we would do um, in this instance is uh, support the sensible amendment that Councillor Donovan has provided. If one wants to get um, the information from uh, trials interstate, one should vote for the motion um, because that information will then be provided. Um, but to sort of, uh, after the event, can the motion and then try and get the report to justify afterwards is a very strange decision-making process. Um, I'll leave you to ponder that, uh, Councillor Hyde, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I think this um, amendment it uh, makes sense uh, to me. Um, I know Councillor Donovan is a big advocate for evidence-based decision-making. And of course, as I said on numerous occasions, uh, it's never been my intention to press ahead with this if the evidence suggests that it's not worthwhile. Um, I'm just asking administration to look at it. Um, and obviously the success of the trials in Melbourne um, would uh, give us reason to do so. 
Um, I take on board the point uh, raised by Councillor Abrahimzada earlier around how that information can be integrated, but we're not able to ask uh, Melbourne or Sydney for that matter on potential sites in our own city, and that's the other part of work that I'd like administration to, to do. Come back to us on how much it might cost um, and come back to us on potential locations. I would imagine there would be some uh, parts of our city that would really benefit from this, um, particularly when one considers pedestrian safety um, and the danger to pedestrians, particularly young people, visitors to our city who may not be familiar with uh, traffic signals. Um, we have had discussions at a, a committee level looking at how we can improve pedestrian safety. We've talked about lowering speed limits. I'm a big advocate for that. Of course, this is just one measure that we can look at. Um, but I encourage members to you know, give this the green light, simply support getting a bit more information so that we can look at this down the track. So it seems Councillor Moran. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Just a quick question to that. I mean, um, uh, do we, uh, with, uh, um, are we trying to solve a problem that we have and we don't have? Uh, does the administration know how many you know, injuries or, or near misses or anything like that that could lead us to uh, be interested in, in uh, furthering a motion like this? CEO. Um, I understand we do have um, data, but I'm not sure we have it here tonight. Um, can you be able to confirm that for me, please? If this fails, can you release it afterwards? <laughs> Thank you, through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, we would be able to provide that data if I could just make a specific point to the target of the trial, though. Um, we wouldn't have that data for the target, which is people uh, using mobile devices. Just wanted to clarify that. So it'd be very general. Just in general. Uh, so members, would anybody else like to speak to this motion, Councillor Moran? Yes, look, I, um, I recommend this motion. I it's like drawing teeth getting uh, some people to vote for things in this. Um, council, it's unbelievable. This is such an easy one to vote for. It's going to fail. Our staff are already furthering it. Um, the government's keen on it. We've got a trial happening in Melbourne at which uh, Helen has very sensibly said we should wait and see. Um, and to answer some of the councillors concerns, our job is safety. It is making people safe in the city. Otherwise, there wouldn't be. You'd be like Naples, no traffic lights, no pedestrian crossings. We have to wear seat belts. Anything that makes the people in our city safer uh, that other cities are doing um, as well is a good thing. Um, to ask that we get the reports that this asks for is to deny the move of the motion and the amender their motion and still admitting that you think it's worthy information and asking the staff to do it. Let me give you a little lesson on local government and our parliamentary um, setup. We don't just go directly to the staff, and you saw how unhappy the Lord Mayor was with that suggestion. We don't go directly to the staff and ask them for reports. This is where we ask for the reports. We don't line up the administration at our office, which I saw happening quite too often in this council, and get them in there and have a little private chat. We do our business in this chamber. And to say that we're gonna vote against this motion and then ask them to further it and to give you the very reports that this motion asks for is absolutely shocking. And you should really think about your behavior, Team Adelaide, if you're gonna vote this down. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Again, just for the benefit of my colleagues, um, I'm certainly not supportive of this motion and I'm not supportive of council taking on board this action. Um, uh, what I would be interested in seeing, particularly with regards to the costs um, of implementing this interstate, particularly seeing as well why, why it failed, um, uh, and also if there was any, any benefit at all, because I'm convinced 
um, that there wouldn't be. Uh, now that is information which should be very easy to come by. And again, certainly I'm not supportive of the government entering um, this realm at all, but I'm not opposed to being armed with further information. Um, furthermore, I take umbrage um, uh, with being lectured on parliaments and governments and that sort of thing. But, but moreover, I would, I would say that the government has not come out in support of this. Um, uh, there have been discussions between departmental staff and our departmental staff um, uh, and, and without being too uh, uh, disparaging, I would say that it certainly sounds like something Dipti would do to say, oh, we've had one failed trial, oh, there's another one that's about to fail and blew out enormously, oh, that's a good idea, why don't we do a trial ourselves? Um, that does sound like a very Dipti thing to suggest in my experience in dealing um, with that department. And so I would just um, reiterate that there's no harm in getting further information. Certainly there is harm if we progress with this motion, because this council does not have the money, um, even if it were a good idea, and I think philosophically we shouldn't be doing it, this council doesn't have the money to spend 250, 300 grand per intersection um, to effectively save people um, from themselves and to do what they should be doing, which is taking care of themselves um, uh, and, and look out and keep an eye out um, uh, in their environs. I mean, I'll stop short of, 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 of talking about natural selection, but by gosh, if, if you are silly enough to stand there at an intersection, um, uh, look at your phone, idly and then waltz into traffic, into oncoming traffic, um, are you really qualified to be walking the streets at all? Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, there is one question I might have, just uh, for clarity. Um, it's really around what success means. Just um, so, Councillor Donovan, it's your motion, just in terms of pending the success of trials, what sort of success would we be looking for? As I am not a traffic engineer, I would be looking to council to give a definition of success within that. Clearly the uh, intent of the motion put forward by Councillor Sims is around pedestrian safety. I would imagine that the any data we got back would be focused on pedestrian safety. Within that, given it would be a report um, I would anticipate there would be information on cost and, you know, potentially considering the cost efficacy versus other similar pedestrian safety measures. Um, as indicated already, uh, these conversations are underway. So it's, um, as, as per Councillor Hyde's comment, no harm in getting further information would be my thinking. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, Um, now, would anybody else like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll go back to the mover, Councillor Donovan, to sum up. Summed up. Summed up. Members, those in favour of the amendment? Those against? That is lost. That goes back to, goes back to the substantive, uh, Councillor Sims. Now, we've got that. Would anybody like to speak further to the substantive? If not, I'll go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. Look, I think we've covered all um, arguments from all angles. I will say, Lord Mayor, I do think it's dangerous to be talking about natural selection when we're talking about pedestrian safety. And we do have a responsibility to everybody that comes through uh, our city. Um, and the point I made earlier around pragmatism, I think is important when we're looking at safety outcomes. I agree it is frustrating to see people engaging with their uh, mobile devices sometimes when uh, walking along streets, um, but uh, people do do it um, and we do have a lot of visitors to our city that might be trying to you know, move around and lots of students and so on. Um, and I take a view that if something improves safety, then we should look at it. Um, and um, I'd encourage members to support this. It's simply an investigation and we'll get the information back and then we can make an assessment in terms of whether it's worth it from a cost benefit analysis or whether we can achieve safety um, through uh, other approaches. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, members, those in favour? Those against? That is lost. Members, we go to item... Councillors, a division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. 
Councillor Sims, Councillor Moran, Councillor Donovan. Members, that takes us to 15.2, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'm going to be on my feet a lot tonight, I, uh, I suspect. I move that Council requested administration, one, investigate opportunities for temporary shelter for people experiencing homelessness, including potential use of the former nurses' quarters at Lot 14 and churches and other religious centres in the city. Two, liaise with the state government, organisations in the homelessness sector, including the Adelaide Zero Project and city-based religious organisations in undertaking any such investigation. Thank you. I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, this um, motion was uh, inspired um, by the discussion that Councillor Moran kicked off around um, looking at uh, what support we can provide uh, to vulnerable members of our community, particularly during winter months. Um, and Councillor Moran talked about encouraging churches uh, and religious centres in the city to do this. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to see that one has done so. I saw that um, reported in the media and hopefully others are, are thinking about it as well. Um, so this is uh, adding to that, looking at other um, opportunities for uh, shelter in the city. Also looking at the nurses' quarters at Lot 14 and the old RAH site um, as something that could be considered. I've um, suggested Lot uh, 14 because um, that was designed for um, accommodation. It has beds and other facilities in place. So that may be something we can explore with the government. And you'll note part two of the motion talks about us liaising with the state government, other organisations in the sector when we're undertaking any investigation. Now, I know, um, Lord Mayor, that some elected members say that this isn't a solution to um, the issue of homelessness in our city. And of course, this isn't meant to be a solution. Um, I've advocated previously on this council for us to uh, ask the federal government for funding for social housing. And I'm of the view that we desperately need that in our city. Um, I've talked before about the fact that Hobart uh, got $30 million from the federal government for social housing in the CBD. And I think this council should be calling on the federal government to do the same. So we need to get money for social housing. This council has investigated um, some policy work um, we, as a result of a motion I put forward earlier in the term, um, and that'll be coming back for us to look at. So I look forward to, to seeing that. We also need to continue to advocate for more investment in mental health. Um, and I note that this council has also supported a motion from Councillor Hyde a few meetings ago, recognising that we face a crisis of homelessness. And we do face a crisis of homelessness in our city. So this motion is around recognising the short term needs of people who are sleeping rough on our city streets. We do need to deal with social housing, we need to deal with mental health support, but we also need to ensure that people who are sleeping on the street have a roof over their head. Um, and uh, I know from the administration's comments, and indeed I already know this to be the case, that one of the big uh, shortfalls in our city at the moment is low barrier temporary accommodation for people who are sleeping rough. And this motion um, asks council to look at some of those opportunities, working with key stakeholders, um, seeing what we can do in terms of identifying sites in the city and um, bringing some of those people together. Um, I really am concerned about um, people sleeping rough, homeless people on our city streets during uh, this cold winter. I know there's been a lot of public advocacy around the code blue um, and um, a lot of organisations have been calling on the state government to exercise discretion in favour of making places available. But this is an additional tool that I think would be really helpful. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Hyde. Um, I have Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I rise not necessarily um, in support of this motion, um, although I will vote for it, uh, just to further conflate members. Um, no, but uh, look, I'm all for having brought motions on homelessness to this chamber before. Um, I'm all for us uh, considering investigating um, anything that will help with what we've identified as a crisis and what the sector um, has identified as a crisis. I just, I mean, just step outside right now and you can see how cold it is. Um, uh, at the moment, but um, uh, this this is a motion uh, that I worry um, won't actually um, really go anywhere. Uh, 
we don't really have the power to direct third parties to open their doors um, uh, to the homeless. Now, those uh, third parties as well aren't necessarily properly equipped um, to take in um, those vulnerable people, even in a, even in a short term uh, sense. And we're not just talking about bedding and and, and other such um, uh, amenities here. We're, we're talking about potentially dealing with um, people that have uh, significant uh, mental health problems and, and the like. Um, so it would be a significant burden that we're that we're asking these third parties to take on. And, and uh, I don't mean to sound cynical, I mean, I will vote for this anyway, just in case they say yes, but I honestly don't think they will. Um, and that's not necessarily a reflection on them. That's not necessarily, necessarily a reflection on the religious organisations or anyone else in the community. Um, uh, but it is uh, just by virtue of the situation um, that we're in. I mean, uh, so uh, I, I do I do worry that we're, we're sort of stepping over the mark here a little bit, but um, at minimum, I am at least uh, happy for us to ask, ask the question, but I think at the end of the day, this sadly is, is a little bit like uh, relieving yourself in a wetsuit. You feel warm and fuzzy, but we're not going to achieve anything um, uh, coming out of this motion, unfortunately. Members, would anybody else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Donovan and Councillor Hyde. For me, this is an interesting motion, Lord Mayor, because uh, what I Lawrence, don't know is whether there is a shortage of physical space for a third party operator to be able to support. I don't know that information. So I see this as an opportunity for administration to consider whether locations like the nurses' quarter or other buildings certainly. Uh, this has been done in Melbourne where they've identified um, old residential care locations that were due to be developed, redeveloped, were identified as an available suitable space and then they found a third party operator who had the capacity to provide the support that was required. So in my mind I see this as an opportunity for us to say is there a shortage of physical property that a existing support body can come in and operate and if so, can we bring those two points together? Um, so for that reason, I will support this motion um, because I think that's that's a potential area that personally I haven't heard discussed in the past um, as to whether there is that shortage or not. And it's, it's possibly something that can be reasonably easily established um, as to whether or not we can play that, that third party intermediary simply to bring A and B together to provide the support that's required. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, um, I first got this idea, and thank and Rob has uh, Councillor Sims has certainly um, enlarged the initial um, thought bubble. Um, Pat, um, I think we all saw the pictures of the lovely old churches in Paris opening their doors for um, people to sleep on the pews um, in the very cold weather. There, uh, we too don't have quite such cold weather, but it's still pretty cold out there. And as uh, Councillor Hyde said, you only have to step out of our front door to um, to see uh, people sleeping out in the teeth of winter. Um, I think uh, I take Helen's point. We need some more evidence base, but I think you have to. Uh, I, I really bridled a bit when some people were quite vicious about this on Facebook, saying, "But it'll mess up the churches, and what about if people steal things?" I mean, I don't like to be sort of too religious about it, but what would Jesus do? I don't think he'd close the front door of the church and let the people sleep out in the rain. And that's what, sadly, we're increasingly seeing in our city. Uh, until recently, we never saw people uh, sleeping rough in winter. Usually they were couch surfing or the aid agencies really ramped up their bringing in. But we are seeing it now, um, seeing people out in the, in the, in the winter. So. I think another step has to be done. This is not a perfect motion. Rob's put in everything I think we could think of that we can open up. Nobody is making anybody do anything. It is an idea to put out there uh, to see if we can get people in out of the rain. Um, I think some people mistook this as why would the churches want to? If the churches don't want to, they don't have to. But I think they should really have a good, long, hard look at themselves if they are not doing everything they can to help. And many churches do do that. And because the thanks to the um, advertiser, um, they did float that idea of, um, of opening church doors as per Paris. And many of the churches, such as Baptist Care, reading that have thought, yes, we will do that. 
and um, have got together with other um, churches who are looking at a similar, uh, opening their church halls on really cold nights and supplying some bank blankets and rudimentary bedding. Um, so if you don't want to vote for it, um, don't. Um, but it seems a very strange thing, um, and I, I commend Councillor Hyde for his calling it a homeless crisis here, but it seems a very funny thing to do to then say, declare a homelessness crisis, and then not, then rebuff um, any ways that we can help to, to look at it, even if they're not perfect. We did re reject um, Councillor Sims' social housing, I can understand the rationale here, there, but I cannot see any rationale for not having a little a, a look at this idea. It has been successfully done in other cities. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I have Councillor Abraham today, then Councillor Kieran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think Councillor Moran described this perfectly. It's not the perfect motion, so the chances are it's not going to have the perfect outcome. But um, if, if I may, I'd just like to share my perspective uh, around homelessness. So really, you've got, you've got two, two things here. You've got your, your assets, which are your properties, your homes, and then you've got your service delivery, which is your tenancy management. It's all well and good for us to um, provide shelter, but if you don't have the service delivery, um, you're really not gonna be able to um, uh, uh, solve this issue. So. Uh, it's, it's kind of like having a car without tires, or it's like having the tires without the car. So it's gonna, you know, it's gonna give you half of uh, half of the solution, not the entire thing. And I don't think if you get half of it, you're not gonna get uh, you're not gonna get get a good result. Nevertheless, I, I am willing to support this. Uh, I think doing something is uh, better than not doing nothing. So uh, I commend um, Councillor Sims for bringing this to, to the chamber. Uh, but um, uh, I look forward to, uh, to more collaboration with, uh, with our stakeholders, uh, like funding the Adelaide Zero Project, which Councillor Hyde uh, did bring into the chamber, um, working with the uh, relevant government agencies. And, uh, uh, and really, um, uh, we as a, as a council, our role here should be to facilitate this, the, uh, the discussion, not to uh, try and go in and, and resolve the issue. And, and, and just for the record, the uh, do you know what the number one reason for homelessness is nationally? Domestic violence. That's what that is. So, uh, nevertheless, I'm willing to support this, and I think doing something is better than doing nothing. And uh, uh, I urge all uh, other members to support this too. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Pim today, and uh, Councillor Carrot. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just for a point of clarity, um, does this motion entail us doing something ourselves, as in? Does this motion entail in any way, as a question I guess for administration, on their interpretation of this motion, uh, is this about council uh, committing its resources to providing shelter, uh, or is this about us directing third parties to commit their resources to provide shelter, or is it is it something in between? I'd, I'd welcome uh, the, the mover to, to respond to that. We're not allowed to, but anyway. I've just, I just need to be clear as, as to what this actually entails here from, from us. Well, what I might do is ask the CEO to respond to the question, and if it needs further clarification, I'll go to Councillor Sims. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I don't see anything here that uh, commits any of Council's properties or assets. Um, to be opened up for housing. It commits that we will investigate um, opportunities and through the ongoing work that we're already doing um, with Housing SA, with uh, not-for-profit with Don Dunstan, to see what else is possible and perhaps make the right connection. So, for example, recently um, someone approached us and through the relationships that we have internally, we're able to connect them to the right service provider. Thank you, thank you for that. So uh, it is not committing our, our resources as such, but what about human resources? Is there any, do you see any uh, scope here for the commitment of, of, of uh, sorry, um, this may be a foolish question, uh, councillors, but I think it's worth asking. Um, uh, is, this, is, this, uh, is this a commitment of, uh, of uh, human resources? Is there a commitment of service of any? Of any um, thank you, Councillor Kerr. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, yes, our 
existing resources will add in some additional work um, to um, support this uh, motion if it's um, endorsed tonight here in the chamber. Um, but we would also be then liaising internally um, with uh, our planning team to better understand uh, Lot 14. Um, so there'll be some work that we could also co-op from other parts of the organisation, but it's, you know, from existing resources. Thanks for that. And, and finally, is there an element of compulsion that we're looking at, uh, moral or otherwise, do you think, uh, in this? I mean, I'm really trying to get a sense of what, what it is we're doing. We are asking third parties to provide services uh, where they are currently not doing so. Um, are we, what, if, if this is, I'm hoping this is a, an essentially a benign motion where we explore and find the gaps, where we explore and find the gaps in the system and, and we help uh, facilitate those gaps to be filled. Um, that, that's what I'm hoping this is, but I'm just trying to get clear because there's been some confusion in the lead up to this motion. Would you like to clarify, Councillor Sims, your intention yeah. with the motion? Look, if I could just clarify for Councillor Kira, um, I would have thought any motion on homelessness is benign. Um, it's not intended to be a malevolent act, um, but um, it, 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 um, it's um, really about looking at what we can do in terms of investigating um, opportunities. So uh, Lot 14 is, um, is mentioned. Um, I mention that because it's a site that's currently vacant, may well be um, appropriately fitted out to house people in a temporary way. Um, and the churches have been mentioned for the reasons that Councillor Moran has identified, um, but there may be other sites as well um, within the city. So this is really utilising um, Council's role as a, a conduit and a facilitator to identify some of those opportunities and to work with uh, organisations in the sector to see whether or not they might be appropriate and, and how we might um, do that. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor, oh, have you Can finished? I speak? Uh, you I may speak. Those two yes, and I just, then I just, I just want, I mean, it's unfortunate Councillor Sims has chosen the opportunity to make that uh, political point. This is not about suggesting anything's malevolent. Uh, it is simply to clarify the purpose here, and, and it, 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 is, it is to suggest, uh, it, it, look, just because there is a motion brought forward about homelessness does not mean it is automatically something that we must all adopt uh, without query. So I would, I, would, I would just hope that Councillor Sims takes that on board uh, with this, with my line of questioning. Uh, I'm trying to determine uh, the, the scope of this motion so that I can vote for it. Pretty normal stuff, Councillor Sims. Thank you, members. Um, Councillor Kouros. I commend uh, Councillor Sims for trying to uh, think outside and uh, for to support the homeless, and that's been very much um, an advocate for as a council. We we want to um, you know give support to the homeless people and, and support the people out in the streets, and it's been very evident as from the report that we've received from the Don Dunstan Foundation. This is increasing. However, when I saw the um, article in which Councillor Moran put forward about the churches opening up their um, uh, their churches for the homeless, I did call uh, the Reverend from the Pilgrim United Church, and they're actually opening up the church for 15 to 18 year olds. Um, she actually said to me that, that she wouldn't be open to the idea for opening up to everybody. Um, there is uh, they don't have the resources to, to um, be able to facilitate people um, in, in adults uh, that have uh, mental health issues or issues that we wouldn't be able to deal with. Further to that, I called um, a further six churches in the city and spoke to the reverends and they all are very concerned about opening up their doors for the homeless. Um, and I, I appreciate that this is a choice that, that you're offering, um, but I wouldn't want to put that pressure onto, onto the, the to the community. Um, they're worried about how they would keep the churches warm at night for, for the homeless people. They're worried about having the proper facilities for them. They're worried about who will clean up. They're worried about um, the damage to the churches, for people with their mental health issues. There's a whole lot of concerns. They're worried about will they get support from the council. Um, they do not want to seem like they're turning their back on homeless people. Um, however, um, it's important that they do a lot for the community, for the, for the homeless, and they do offer services to support them out in the street. Um, I, I won't be supporting this motion. I do support anything to do with homelessness, but I will not support the fact of putting pressure on third parties to open up their doors 
um, for if they don't have the facilities and you know that they're, they're only a volunteer based church and I, and I, I wouldn't want to put any pressure on that. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I wasn't going to speak, Lord Mayor, but just listening to everyone. Um, look, I just wanted to make a quick, two, a few quick observations. Um, we're very quick to want to take the, the, the prayer out of our agenda, and then we're very quick to rush to the churches when there's times of needs and religious organisations when there's times of needs. Um, there is a challenge here, and we're talking about 200 people sleeping rough in our streets. We have 25,000 ratepayers in the city of Adelaide. If we want to affect change, that's 0.8% of them making a move to help. That is where change occurs. Where change occurs is with us. We've got three community centres, North Adelaide Community Centre. Why don't we have a show of hands from councillors that are prepared to man it and we'll open it up for the night and we can all sit up there and help out with the homeless. Yeah. I mean, that's the work we can do. If you want to do it, this is how you do it. You open up your box factory, your box factory, you open up the Southwest Community Centre, you open up North Adelaide and you have them up there on your streets. That's what you do to affect change. You don't point the finger at a religious body that has no funding, no power, no resource to but affect the outcome. You don't do the same thing on a state government site when they've just announced today and a few days ago an $8 million investment into the site. I can tell you right now, the answer is no, because the site's committed. They're committed to other projects. That's the reality. Asking questions that we know the answers for. We spent half an hour debating a motion that we know what the answer is. Councillor Moran has put it out in the public already, and people know very clearly that she's called for the churches to be open for the homeless. People in the community know. Now it's a matter for the community to take that on board and decide if they can do it or not. With us going to them saying, open up your doors without resources, without us providing money. I had a variation to this motion that I flagged earlier with elected members on email and I consulted the administration on it. We've had our uh, bus shelters opened up before. We've had other parts of organisations opened up before. Members, Deputy Lord Mayor speaking. And we haven't been able to keep our part of the bargain in this. It's cost us a significant amount of money. We don't have the resource to deliver it either. So I will ask elected members, if you want to affect change, get on the phone, call a few of your friends in the South and North Adelaide, Councillor Moran, I'm sure you can get a few people together and a few others where we can get people together to look after 200 people. It's not a hard task if you think about it. We've got 11 people around the room. If we can't crack and provide accommodation for 200 people, a bunch of us, 11 councillors around this room, then why are we here? Why are we here? So we can ask the state government and go home and sleep in our cosy beds? Come on, guys. This is really half an hour of, let's ask the state government. Let's ask daddy for money. Let's ask daddy for money. Let's ask the religious organisations for money because that's all we need to do. We, we don't know what else to do. We don't know what our solution is. I am prepared to commit time outside this chamber where I sit with whoever councillor that sits here to talk about homelessness with people in the community. I'm happy to spend my time doing that to solve the problem, but this is not a solution. Happy to support it. This is nothing. So what Councillor, what Councillor Abraham Zeta mentioned before was very clear when he said in his talk, there are people in this room that understand the impact of homelessness and domestic violence, and there are, these are the people I look for when I'm making decisions in this room. Sorry, Lord Mayor. Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up. Uh, thank you. I don't have a problem supporting this, but the solution is not on the wall. Um, just before I, th I go back to Council Centre, does anybody, I think everybody's spoken now. Um, I did actually um, uh, speak with um, Baptist Care this afternoon, um, who are the lead provider around Code Blue. So the Code Blue is when it's five degrees and under. They generally open 10 to 12 nights a season. Um, and they also believe they're not going far enough to help those, but they're not resourced enough to do it more often. The CEOs of the sector actually met together last night, again, confirming that Baptist Care is the lead provider. Um, and they have um, agreed that they will open more often. They're also going to um, call the code blue more often because at the moment it's five degrees and there was an instance last weekend where the forecast was for six degrees, so they didn't call a code blue, the state government didn't call a code blue, and it was actually three degrees overnight. Um, so our CSOs uh, have a job to do to make sure that vulnerable people know which places are open. Um, and 
and that is the job that we're trying to do. But the sector itself is going to the state government and is advocating for further places and further resources so that they can open more often. Um, so again, as long as we uh, make sure we are speaking to the sector group and uh, and the lead providers in the sector group when we go forward. I'll pass back to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And look, that's really uh, useful information. So um, thank you for that. Look, I just want to remind um, members of this council that all that's being asked for here is an investigation for opportunities for temporary shelter, including, it's not, a, it's not an expansive list, it's an including, including the former nurses' quarters at Lot 14, churches, other religious centres, and including means there may well be other spaces as well. Um, and in doing that, will be engaging with organisations that work in the sector. It's not the intention to set up a shelter where there's no support around and that can't be attended or where there's no support structure. Obviously, that wouldn't work. But we know from feedback that we've had from the sector over a long period of time that the gap is in social housing, long-term accommodation, and council is advocating on that. But the other gap is in um, temporary accommodation temporary shelter, low access shelter. And the effects of that are found or noticed in particular during extreme heat and extreme cold. Of course, I agree with the comments that Councillor Abrahimzada has made around the root causes of homelessness. I'm not disputing that in, in any way. This doesn't address the root causes. This addresses a symptom of the broader problem. It's about putting in place some support so we don't have uh, people sleeping on our streets in pouring rain and in freezing temperatures. And, you know, the Deputy Lord Mayor is right. This isn't a, an overarching solution. It's, it's one small step, um, but it is better than us doing nothing. It's, uh, it's a step in terms of us trying to facilitate um, some uh, finding some accommodation. And I, I don't mean to, when I say doing nothing, I don't mean to imply that council is doing nothing. Our, our staff do do a lot of work in this area. Um, and I know work very hard in terms of trying to support vulnerable people in the city. But what I mean in terms of temporary shelter, um, we could be playing a role in, in terms of facilitating working with key sectors, um, working with key stakeholders in the city, including the churches, but not limited to the churches, talking to them about religious centres that they may have available and other areas as well. The Deputy Lord Mayor said the nurses' quarters is already committed for work. Well, it's a temporary shelter. Maybe there's a way that there can be a stopgap measure put in place. So I'd encourage members to not get too hung up on this idea that we're compelling people to open up buildings or we're seizing land from them. We're doing no such thing. This is just simply a measure asking council to investigate what opportunities there might be for temporary shelter so that we are able to provide some relief to the most vulnerable people in our city, people who are sleeping outside in extreme freezing weather. And, you know, this is just one, um, one way of trying to provide some relief to those people. Members, we go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, right, we will go to uh, 15.3, Councillor Sims. I'm back. Lucky last motion from me, um, Lord Mayor. I move that Council request that administration investigate the potential use of transparent recycling bins in the City of Adelaide to encourage better waste management and recycling practices. Note the inclusion of recycling bins. So you wish to add the word into your motion? Yes, after transparent recycling bins in the City of Adelaide. That was an omission. Okay, I'll look for a seconder. So, sorry, Councillor Hyde. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, as you know, um, Lord Mayor and other councillors would know, I'm a big advocate for transparency on this council. Um, I have been uh, talking about transparency for some time um, and uh, I'm all for it, particularly when it encourages people to recycle. Um, and uh, members would recall we had a discussion about this at committee uh, last week when um, I floated this idea in discussion and, and so I decided to um, put a motion forward. 
But the intention behind this is that by having um, transparent bins, recycling bins in the city, you are able to encourage people to think a little bit more about their waste management practices, to think a little bit more about recycling um, and what they throw away. And I think that could only be good in terms of producing positive environmental outcomes. Um, this isn't about shaming uh, people, Lord Mayor. That was a throwaway line, if I can use the uh, pun. Um, it's not about shaming people. It is about trying to encourage positive behavioural change. Um, and this is an extra tool in the toolkit uh, to help us do that. Um, South Australia's got a really good record when it comes to recycling and waste management. We were the first state in the country to introduce a container deposit scheme. And in fact, that's been a world leader. Um, we were also the first state in the country to look at imposing a fee on plastic bags as a way of trying to phase those out. Um, and we've got the state government currently looking at trying to get rid of single use plastics, which I also think is fantastic. So we've really led the way when it comes to um, recycling practices. And this is just one other thing that we might want to consider um, that would help change behaviour. Just to be clear around the scope of this, I'm just asking for an investigation. Um, I would expect that in any investigation, uh, one of the options that would be looked at is maybe a voluntary residential trial for residents who are interested. Um, it was never the intention to compel people to use um, these kind of bins. Um, it may also be that there's uh, a rollout of some of these clear bins in our public spaces. And Rundle Mall, for instance, is a, um, a great site for tourists and visitors to our city. It sometimes can be a little bit confusing for people that are new to the city to understand our recycling practices. And um, see-through bins used in places like Sydney, also used in France and uh, in Italy and in the United States, would encourage people to think a little bit more about what goes where. So I think it makes sense from, um, from that perspective too, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to uh, second this motion and support it in principle. And I'm also pleased that um, Councillor Sims has, has taken on board feedback from our discussions, because um, I do think it did whip up a little bit of a frenzy uh, at the time. Um, people were concerned that their nosy neighbours um, I would finally get the opportunity to uh, go go through their rubbish, um, and they were also concerned that those nosy neighbours uh, might uh, actually shame them um, uh, for their lack of recycling uh, prowess. But um, what I'm supportive of uh, uh, is not some sort of Orwellian Orwellian um, uh, local government area where neighbours dob in other neighbours for not being green enough. Um, what I am supportive of is that that voluntary trial, um, uh, so that people uh, may be uh, who are who are recycling proud um, uh, can get hold of a, a clear bin, um, and uh, when when rubbish day comes around, they can put that on the street um, uh, and show off to their neighbours how good they are and uh, how good they are for the environment. Um, certainly, I would be doing that um, when I criticise my housemates for not recycling enough, but. Um, Ultimately, as well, that could also consider uh, at the conclusion of a trial or, or further down the track, uh, attritional replacement of recycling bins. If it seemed to be a success, if people are talking about it, um, uh, once they work out the world's not going to cave in, um, uh, then we could consider attritional replacement of recycle bins um, in a very ordered um, and methodical way and not one um, that will uh, in, in, impose a huge cost um, on the council. Um, I think that could be a, a viable measured step-by-step -step way forward and I commend the motion. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Uh, well, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I really have to urge caution with this one. Um, we're hearing a we're, we're hearing a sort of a backtracking. Um, we heard initially this is about shaming people. Um, we're hearing now that's not the case. It's just uh, volu you know, it's just voluntary to show off your recycling. Um, but then we hear from from Councillor Hyde that that can be followed by attritional replacement. So this this is just the edge of the wedge stuff. Um, I don't. I mean, I can, I can see where Councillor Sims is coming from with this. There, there is a problem uh, with, with recycling practices, but, uh, you know, a lot of the problem with recycling is not what goes in the recycling bin, uh, it's what doesn't go in the recycling bin. A lot of the problem is uh, rests with the red bin, uh, where things that ought to be recycled end up in the red bin. This doesn't really go to that. But there is, the other side of the argument is, is just that this is, um, uh, you know, it is fundamentally undignified to uh, expect people to have their rubbish open and clear on the streets for others to see. I don't think that our retirees 
uh, you know, our senior citizens who spend their whole lives paying rates uh, deserve to have a system that will inexorably lead towards their rubbish uh, being uh, open and display on, on our streets. It is, it is literally a, you know, that is literally a, gro literally a grotesque invasion of privacy. Uh, it, is it is literally a grotesque invasion of privacy um, because you will have the grotesque spectacle of streets that have uh, uh, pins that we can see through. We can do better than this uh, for our residents and our ratepayers. I've received comments already about this saying, look, this is just, what is this, Stalin, it's Orwell, it's, you know, and it just unfortunately has that creepy overtone. And I think that it's a thin end to the wet stuff. It's a bad policy, you should go straight in the red bin, unfortunately. <laughs> Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, Matter Council that knows so much about rubbish. Uh, this is really interesting because, uh, again, very similar to some of the other motions. <laughs> if there's a problem, then provide an education way to fix it. We've already got a rubbish bin that sits there. If we need to teach people how to recycle, we'll teach people how to recycle. The feedback that I've received so far to date has been really around um, the privacy aspect, but also the aspect of having potential criminals that will drive past houses knowing that someone just bought a new laptop or a new phone or any of those issues and know exactly what's inside the houses. So there is risks associated with that as well. We need to be mindful of then uh, people in our community, our ratepayers, that are not using the bin correctly because they are fearing uh, that people would know what purchases they've made um, inside their house. And that is also a concern um, of mine. That's why I wouldn't be supporting this. Uh, there is an opportunity for us, and I've seen this a lot, and it's happening a Councillor lot. Councillor Hyde, through... would you mind taking your seat while the Deputy Lord Mayor is speaking? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've seen, um, uh, even in, in, in other countries where there's apps that's been developed for kids to be able to take on that education campaign and learn about recycling, because in essence, they are our future. So instead of talking about attrition, potentially of bins, talking about attrition of people, where they become more educated. And then we're filling in the gaps of people that don't understand how to use the system and use it better. Uh, also, the other thing that councillors need to be mindful of, this is a not, um, you know, from a recruitment perspective, you can't sort of one bin supplied to one house. You've got to order a lot of bins, keep them in storage, and then supply them to houses as they're requested. If it is successful, then you've got to get rid of all the other bins because if people don't want them anymore. So there's a significant cost here. This is another one of those things that, you know, do you open the tap? There's no point of opening the tap if potentially we can educate our ratepayers. You can even provide a rate incentive for ratepayers if they recycle well. We can do a, a test for bins every now and again if that's one of the things you want to encourage our ratepayers to do the right thing. That's one way to do it. I don't see it being a way of us introducing a whole fleet of transparent bins in our streets. Um, it is to shame and it is to also invade the privacy of residents and businesses in the city. So we've got to ask members to not support this motion. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Sims had a lot of coverage with us with the media, and uh, I received a numerous yeah. amount of calls in, in regard to this. Um, and a lot of the feedback that I got was Members, please. people feel that they, uh, they are being policed and not doing the right thing. Um, safety and their privacy has been compromised. Um, scratch bins, uh, the bins will end up being scratched and looking terrible. Um, the uh, costly to set up, removal of all the bins and then replacing it with other bins. Um, they don't, the, the, I didn't get a very good feedback from people in regards to this and I'm going to respect what people's thoughts are. In a personal perspective, I think education is key. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's very important that we have these campaigns or tell people how to recycle um, rather than, you know, shaming them. Um, I think, you know, going back to a campaign in which um, we had a slip slop, it was a slip slop slap campaign where people weren't, you know, were taking care, needed to put on, you know, um, you know, to fight cancer council uh, from the council council. That's a really, um, it was very educational and we've all moved on. We all know the importance. I think we need to go back to educating people that the importance of recycling, we need to tell them what goes in recycle bins rather than putting them up and shaming them um, for, for it. That's my opinion and that's the feedback that I've got from people. Thank you, Councillor Canal, and then Councillor Abraham today, and then Councillor Hunt. I mean, if we wish to encourage uh, people to recycle, etc., then you, you find ways to make it easier for them to do so or find other triggers 
uh, that enables them to, uh, you know, or encourages them to to use, you know, the, the, the recycling, etc., and, and do the right thing. And I mean, if I go back to an experience uh, uh, in Switzerland, uh, they weigh the rubbish, and you pay different rates for the rubbish that they collect. And obviously, for the waste, you pay more, and for the for the recycling and for the green waste, it is different uh, monetary amounts. That is genuine encouragement because you will have every every opportunity to minimise your waste. With the education and things like that, you can encourage people to do what they do, and it's it's a way of saving money and whatever else. But it also is very specific, and they, that's what they've done uh, in some of the constituencies there in the, uh, to uh, encourage people to do that. That is what works. Not a clear bin that has a number of parts uh, glued together or, or welded together, which will would quite potentially become a risk after a while, because at the end of the day, these things are picked up by uh, sets of arms and things that they could start to uh, perish and potentially could be a risk. So I just think uh, we could do it in other ways. Thank you, Councillor Ivers, Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I think Councillor Koros uh, touched on a very, very uh, good point in terms of uh, education and how you can campaign these things. Slip, slop, slap. There is uh, the other one where uh, you know you drink, drive. You're a bloody idiot. Uh, uh, I'm sure they've had uh, stuff around smoking. Um, there's uh, there's been lots, lots of these educational campaigns, and I think uh, that's 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 the key here. Um, in, in my opinion, I think what would work well is that if uh, um, if we do this maybe to public bins, because then that will, uh, that will work with the educational campaign. Uh, as, you're, as you're holding the kids' hands, you're walking through Rundle Mall, there's a transparent bin, you point to it and you say, well, you know, that, that's what recycling is all about. These are the certain things that you can recycle and these are certain things that you can't recycle. I think that works hand in hand with, uh, uh, with, with an education campaign. I, I think to, to, to take it to people's houses, um, uh, well, we've heard from, from all, uh, uh, all sides and, and, uh, and a few members here in terms of uh, what sort of issues that can cause. I'm not really supportive of that, but uh, if we want to um, do it to, to our public means, I think uh, that would be a worthwhile exercise. Thank you, Councillor Ho. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, I have uh, different opinions on this. And firstly, I would like to thank Councillor Sims to bring this motion up. I have just noticed that you have uh, just add up something red over there, transparent recycling bins, not transparent red bins. Right. In the I believe this is a good idea and I will support it. Just like Council Sim said, this is not about shaming people or punishing people or anything like that. It is about encouraging people to model best practice when it comes to recycling. According to the Australian <coughs> Bureau of Statistics, the average Australian creates just over two tons of waste each year. Each household spends over $1,266 on goods purchased but have never been used. Around $600 worth of food is wasted by each household each year. Average Australian sends more than one ton of waste to landfill each year. By having these transparent bins, people will know better about what they actually put in the bins and how much rubbish they put in the bins. Imagine, every time when you put your bins out on the street, you look at your bins and notice that you might have put many unfi unfinished food in it or some stuff you have never used. It might remind you that not to overpurchase next time while you're in the supermarket. When people see their hard-earned money being put in the bin, I can guarantee you that they will start to think how to reduce their waste and not to put their hard-earned money in the bins. On the other hand, it is very important for people to know that what kind of stuff they should put in the recycling bins. If they don't know, they could just look at the neighbor's bins and this works well for those newcomers like myself. Over the last couple of days, we have received many feedbacks from the public. The main concerns from the public are privacy and cost of replacing the bins. <clears throat> Firstly, about privacy. Well, if you don't want people to know what you actually put in the bin and what you have just purchased, simply turn the box inside out and put it in the bin. All right? By, do, by, by doing such small things, you are doing your bit to save the planet for future generations. Instead of raising your voice for those motherful statements, I think it would be better for all of us to just start to do those little things. Secondly, about the cost 
to replace those bins. We don't have the we don't have to archive all the bins and dump it. We can just use it for other purposes. Say use it for storage for the recycling bottles. Maybe. Whenever you have stored enough bottles, you can either take it to the recycle depot or simply just put it on the street. Guarantee. Oh, sorry, Lomé, I might need another minute. Okay. <laughs> the first time I asked for it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ho. You have one more minute. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, like I said, you can either take it to the recycle depot or just sell it, or otherwise you put it on the street for the poor people come to collect it and sell it. They might only get 10 bucks, but it's very important for them. And besides that, they don't have to search your red bean or the yellow beans for it. Just give them a bit more dignity when they take out, when they take out the bottles for your beans. All right. Just to sum up, I believe this is a good idea and it's something the local council can do. And I'd like to, I'd like to ask the members to support it. This is not a motherhood statement, but something really down to the earth for local council to consider. Thank you. Well, wow. <laughs> that's, that's a new move. Um, now, Councillor Donovan. I think I'm happy to support this motion because I see that inherent within the motion is, given it's an investigation, that it would be pending uh, further information and research from other areas that have done this. I personally have not seen any research on outcomes of this. I haven't seen that it's successful or unsuccessful. Perth's just rolled it out in a trial. We don't yet know the outcome of that. Given it's an investigation, I would see that inherent within it is pending the uh, information that we can gain from other trials because from a behaviour change perspective, if we haven't seen this specific um, activity done before, I can see that there's potential for it to be a positive signal. There is the potential that it may well, which is obviously why Perth is doing it. Um, but likewise, I can see that there could be some negative ramifications. So I would happily support it, noting that it's an investigation and assuming that within that is pending data from other trials that are underway. Members, I think everybody has spoken. I'll go back to the mover, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And look, what a wonderful debate. Um, and I think it's terrific to see uh, this council talking about recycling and what we can do to try and um, improve that within um, our city. And I particularly uh, commend uh, Councillor Ho for his contribution um, because I think he's made a very good point um, about the container deposit scheme in our um, public uh, spaces. Um, we do often see um, people uh, rummaging through those bins to try and uh, get cans and bottles. Um, and it's great that we have the container deposit scheme in place. It would make life a little bit easier for those people if we had transparent bins and they were able to identify um, where they can access these things. Um, as uh, has been discussed, the intention behind this was never to compel people to uh, adopt these bins at a residential level. Um, and if we do ever look at it as a residential level as part of any investigation, it would be voluntary um, in a trial as a way of seeing whether this does in fact lead to some positive behavioural change. But public spaces and public bins, absolutely. And um, as I've said, uh, we do have a good track record here in our city um, dealing with recycling, um, but this is something that has been looked at in other parts of the world. And if it changes behaviour for the better, then I think we should look at it. Um, we do have a reputation as a clean green city and um, this, if it's done well, could only um, enhance that. But certainly not mandatory and never intended to shame people. It's about uh, leading to positive behavioural change. Thank you, councillor members. Those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Now, members, we have been going for a little while now. Um, would anybody like a five minute break before we continue with the uh, agenda? Um, uh, because I certainly might like one from yes. the chair. Yes. If I could, if, if members, are you happy to have a five minute break? Thank you, we'll just adjourn for five minutes. <laughs>
Members, thank you very much. We will resume on the agenda. Uh, so we are at, now at item 15.4, uh, Councillor Moran, motion on notice standing orders. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I move that the Council immediately remove sections section 229.2 and section 230 of the standing orders, which refers to councillors engaging with the media. And I look for a second to Councillor Hyde to second. Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak? I will uh, reserve my right, Lord Mayor. Councillor Hyde, do you wish to speak? I'll reserve my right. Councillor Abraham Zadeh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I move that the motion be put. I look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Okay. So, members, um, now that the motion has been put, that means we go to the vote. Oh, we're voting on the motion to put. Thank you. That's what <laughs> uh, those in favour of the motion being put? Those against? Uh, that is carried. The motion will now be put. Those in favour of the motion? Those against? The motion is carried. Council's division has been called on the motion. Those in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until all names have been called. Oops. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Carer, uh, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Kuros, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Moran and Councillor Sims. Members, um, given we've just dealt with 15.4, uh, the content of 15.5 has been, will be considered dealt with and we move on to 15.6. 15.6 is Councillor Hyde's motion on notice for Stephen Street. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move this motion in the terms that it appears on the agenda. Uh, you know, seconder in, sorry, Councillor Moran was seconder. Councillor Hyde. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, this motion before us is, is fairly um, self-explanatory. It's, um, it's the result of, I think, uh, what has been a, a good community-driven and also council-receptive process um, uh, from our residents uh, in South Ward. Um, councillors Donovan and Sims uh, and myself went down there to meet with them. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was actually a discussion that came out of their street party um, as well around the safety issues that occur um, uh, with this street. Um, uh, of course, Stephen Street is, uh, I suppose, uh, tangential to uh, Gilly Street Primary. Um, it is, uh, as many of the streets are, particularly in South Ward, uh, a very narrow street with footpaths that are uh, not very wide, also not uh, DDA um, compliant, but that's not necessarily what we're looking to address here. Um, there are also power lines on the street and that, on the footpath, and that affects um, uh, pedestrians, it means they are forced then onto the road as well. Um, and of course, in peak hour, you see uh, school children using this street a lot. You see uh, people uh, more or less rap running between um, Gilly Street and Halifax Street using it. Um, uh, kids on bikes as well, uh, mothers with prams. Um, it, it is just not a very safe environment at the moment. Um, uh, and that's why um, uh, this motion um, looks to address that. There are also concerns uh, that the residents have that uh, there could be more greening on the street. Now, whether that's trees or some other green walls or, or something like that um, installed, this motion allows for the consideration of all those sorts of elements um, to be taken into account um, uh, in, a, in a design uh, process that will include the residents who uh, do have a very tight-knit community there and they have a, a fairly good idea around um, what they want to see happen in the street. Um, they just need the experts to, to come in um, and help them with that process and then, of course, to fund it. Um, bearing in mind that we did just pass our budget, um, the designs uh, as per part four of this motion um, will be coming out of any savings that we identify, um, uh, which I think is a sensible way to go about it. Um, uh, and also, I would just uh, like to highlight that the administration, um, like myself, uh, I've done, um, might like to engage the school as well um, and speak with them uh, about their thoughts on how this uh, process should unfold. Um, uh, and also, 
uh, perhaps there may be the opportunity, given it is in such close proximity to a school, um, for potentially the state government to be involved in delivering a solution here as well. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the designs are one thing, but the build is another, um, uh, and, it, and it will uh, be a not insignificant amount of money that we might like to um, uh, seek assistance uh, in funding ourselves. So I commend the motion to you. Thank you. Councillor Moran, did you respond? I also commend the motion, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Now, Councillor Donovan, I did see your hand go up before, but I think it might have been to second the motion. It was to second the motion. Likewise, I will have my two seconds. So I'll go to Councillor Sims first and then back to you, Councillor. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I just, just briefly want to thank Councillor Hyde for putting this forward. Um, as Councillor Hyde said, I joined uh, he and Councillor Donovan in meeting um, with the residents to talk about this. Um, and uh, yeah, I really encourage members to support this. It's a, a good way to get some action happening on the street. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So I'd like to thank the administration team who have already um, put time into this. Uh, Keith Davis uh, in strategy and design has already thought through uh, some of the options that are possible here and I absolutely support this motion. It simply takes what has already been commenced and turns it into a practical action that we can follow through and ensure it's funded. Um, and I think the, uh, the residents of the street have put forward some excellent arguments and by bringing us to the street allowed us to see at a, uh, at a peak time on a, on a school day just how much traffic goes up and down, how much foot traffic goes up and down that street and chooses not to use the footpath uh, because it is completely inadequate. So there are many, many footpaths like that throughout the city. This one is um, in the area of a, a school and therefore is of particular importance. So I absolutely commend this motion to the Chamber. Thank you. Members, any other speakers? If not, I'll go to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Summed up. Thank you, Members. To vote those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, we now go to 15.7, um, Councillor Hyde, motion on notice, State Government Night Economy Tax. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I move the motion in terms it appears on the agenda. And Deputy Lord Mayor seconded. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so we've just had the state budget uh, come down, by and large uh, a fairly good budget, and there are many things uh, to be commended in there. Um, but noting the state government is scrounging around for cash at the moment, um, it is incumbent upon us as the City of Adelaide uh, to advocate for our ratepayers and make sure that they're not the victims um, uh, of, uh, of, a, of a budget that is in need of more revenue. Um, and so we've, saw, we've seen um, in this budget a number of uh, fees and charges um, that are increased. Um, but uh, what, what to a degree uh, missed the news originally and has since been fleshed out a little bit um, is that the licensing fees um, uh, for venues uh, late night venues has have increased substantially. Um, this was something that was picked up by the Deputy Lord Mayor and there was a motion uh, without notice shortly after it came to light. Um, and the results of well, the preliminary results of that report um, are here. But uh, as we can see, there are 761 impacted businesses uh, in the city of Adelaide uh, that will uh, likely have increased fees. And some of those fees are, are stretching into the uh, thousands of dollars um, above what they were otherwise paying. Um, uh, it, is, it creates a huge impost on business. And I think at a time when the city of Adelaide, uh, we are looking to lower costs for businesses. We are looking to cut red tape for businesses to make sure that they have uh, uh, more of their own money to then reinvest um, in their business. Um, and so it is, uh, it is counterintuitive or it goes against what we're trying to achieve for businesses in the city um, uh, to then jack up uh, those uh, those fees and charges imposed by the state government by such a high amount. But um, we're also at risk of doing damage uh, to a nightlife and a night economy um, that I don't think can take uh, any more punches uh, as far as draconian government legislation goes. We've seen um, uh, the lockout laws where, whereby uh, these venues are, are barred from having any new patrons enter um, at 3 a.m. Uh, we've seen that drastically affect uh, the patronage of these venues and we haven't i don't think have really seen any uh, increase in safety or any any lesser inc incidents in fact anecdotally uh, there's an argument that people locked out of these venues that uh, create more havoc on the streets so so this is an unfolding um, uh, policy area um, where there are lots of issues at play here using using licensed venues as a punching bag 
um, and raiding them as a piggy bank uh, is not how uh, the government should be trying to fill its coffers. It will end up doing more damage um, to the economy in the long run as these uh, businesses uh, uh, have to either shed staff or put up their prices um, and shed customers and potentially in the worst cases close. And we've seen um, how tough some pubs are doing it. Uh, at the moment as well. So I think it's incumbent on us to advocate for these ratepayers in particular um, uh, to ensure that, uh, that they're getting a fair hearing from the government and to put the case um, that we shouldn't be increasing these costs. I can make a motion to change. Sorry. In brief, um, Lord Mayor, I've spoken about this earlier, but just a couple of things to note that uh, Councillor Hyde did cover on, but uh, I'd like to expand on a bit. Um, 761 venues, we're talking about potential increases of seven folds where some of the late night venues that are trading past 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning are going to be paying an additional $60,000 a year. It's a significant amount of money. We're not talking about uh, you know, a measly 5%, 10%, 50% increase. We're talking about a significant amount of money here. The problem I see from a taxation system that provides this level of tax is if a business goes under, you lose that tax revenue. Uh, and no more businesses will enter the system as a result, which means you don't have future generated revenue either. Unlike land tax or anything else the government applies, that revenue is transitional, so it will be picked up despite who has it. In the case of these small businesses, once they close, they're not coming back online, you've destroyed the economy. Especially the night economy for us, which is a very sensitive topic. I know um, we're yet to have a, a discussion as a council around uh, lockout laws and the impact they have on the night economy, be it benefit or not. Um, and all of those sort of measures that we're talking about from the state government perspective and council uh, go really uh, far and wide in having an impact on our night economy in the city. And it's not the type of language we want to use, especially when we're talking about, you know, UNESCO City of Music, we're talking about late night activation. All of that stuff disappears very quickly. I can understand that the government potentially trying to deal with, you know, what they call a risk tax. Uh, and depending on the venues that are opening post midnight, two o'clock, four o'clock, they have different levels of licensing. Um, but I think um, if we can't get anywhere with the state government, I think it's important that we do commission a further piece where we understand the literal impact on the businesses in the city, because this report doesn't provide that information. And I can understand it's very challenging because different licensing fees will apply to different venues depending on the times they open. Even for them, it's quite complex. Um, but look, I'd ask members to support this, and I really hope that we can uh, get some sense, at least into the upper house in the ledge code, to able to get some outcomes with regards to small businesses in the city, because impact on 761 businesses is significant. We're talking about the size of Rondel Mall. This is how many retailers you have in Rondel Mall. Imagine that whole sector has been impacted. So it's a significant impact. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, I also support um, the motion. I'm really, really concerned about what the government are proposing here. It is a king hit on the night economy of our city. And, you know, we've seen what has happened in places like uh, Sydney, where um, we've had draconian lockout laws, uh, new restrictions on um, bars and so on. And what that has done is thrown a great big wet blanket over that city and um, killed off nightlife. And I don't want to see the same thing happening here in Adelaide. We've finally started to see momentum building in the night economy in our city. Um, we've seen the narrative as a result about Adelaide start to change over recent years. And um, people are excited, they're energised about being out in town. Um, there are lots of small bars that are popping up. Popping up. There's a huge energy. Um, and I think that's a really, really great thing. And what we should be doing is trying to sustain that momentum and keep that moving forward, not casting a great big wet blanket over that with um, new taxes. So um, I'm against what the government are proposing and um, I commend Councillor Hyde for taking leadership on this. Members, oh, Councillor Hyde to sum up. Thank you, members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is Carol. Councillor Hyde, a 15, what a surprise, 15.8. Councillor Hyde, motion or no, it's attracting more young people to the city. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I move the motion in the terms that it appears on the agenda and seek a second. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, and can I just say, Lord Mayor, that if the Stephen Street motion was a great example of um, 
policy development coming from the community upwards. This is a wonderful example of policy development coming from the top um, downwards, as, as you yourself uh, uh, got me onto this idea. Um, uh, and of course, I suppose as the youngest um, councillor, uh, I think it's a, a, a brilliant idea to have a millennial strategy in the city. Although having said that, I actually am not even sure that I qualify as one. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, it would be great to have more young people living in the city. Um, what we do know about South Australia uh, is that our largest export um, is uh, well-educated uh, young people interstate. Um, this brain drain um, is a real issue uh, for both our city and our state overall. Um, it's one that the state government um, are aware of and conscious of um, as well. Uh, but we as a city can do our part um, uh, in addressing that, and not least of all, because that motion that was just passed, that's a, that's a key example of it, and it fits into it somewhat. But um, we need to appreciate that in, in this world, um, capital, uh, human capital is incredibly mobile, um, uh, which means that uh, people, well-educated people, um, uh, capable people, uh, will go to where there is opportunity, um, but they'll also go to where there is a good lifestyle. Um, and to where uh, they feel most comfortable, uh, to where they can basically uh, be their best self, to borrow sort of a millennial term um, at the moment. Um, so there are some other cities uh, that are looking at millennial strategies and developing millennial strategies at the moment. I think it's incumbent on our city um, uh, to take this approach as well. Um, we have so much untapped potential uh, in, in the city of Adelaide to attract those young people. Um, for me, as someone who moved into the city a few years ago, um, I'd never, never really contemplated living in living in the CBD. Um, uh, but it is actually uh, something that's quite achievable. Um, it's not really expensive, especially compared to the eastern states and even compared to the <laughs> suburbs. Um, and uh, noting that noting that we could use some more uh, um, activated uh, and vibrant precincts. Um, in the city, and we're working on that as it is now. Um, there is still a very, very good, a very good and comfortable life um, in the city of Adelaide, uh, and it's something that we should be uh, aiming to, to target at those millennials, um, both inside the state but also outside the state as well. Um, as things like Lot 14 um, come online, a, a sort of a defence industry um, as well that will need a sort of highly skilled workers. Um, in it, so uh, there is a lot of a lot of opportunity here for the city of Adelaide to attract more young people to live in it, um, uh, not just because of uh, increasing opportunities, but also because of lifestyle. Um, and I would love for the administration um, to start working on this strategy, and hopefully it can factor into our strategic plan moving forward for the next few years. Thank you, Councillor Hyde, Deputy Lord Mayor. Is that right? Members, <laughs> uh, Councillor Sims. <laughs> Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, as a young person myself, I'm very um, supportive of, um, of this. Um, and uh, I do uh, commend um, Councillor Hyde for um, pushing it forward. Um, I think, you know, Adelaide is a great place to live and work, um, and particularly for young people um, like us. And uh, yeah, I think I'm very supportive of this, and I look forward to the, the work being done. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. As the other millennial in the, in the chamber, I thought I might uh, uh, say a couple of words. I do commend Councillor Hyde for bringing this into the chamber, and uh, uh, I, I think this is a great move to, to make because uh, it, uh, it shows that we are planning ahead and we are planning for, uh, um, uh, I guess, creating a good environment for our future generations uh, to, to come in and, and settle in the, into the CBD. And just like Councillor Hyde, I didn't really see myself living in the city, but now that I am in the city, uh, I've got uh, uh, so many so many advantages and benefits, uh, whether it be sleeping in because my workplace is only a five minute walk down the road or uh, um, um, going out and not worrying about uh, catching a cab or a, or a taxi home. So uh, there are many, many advantages and I think uh, it uh, will uh, be, be great for us to, uh, to put a strategy together because uh, it is about long term thinking. So I, I, uh, uh, I encourage all members to vote for this. Members, of course, a good opportunity to uh, promote our place brand of Design for Life because Adelaide is one of those cities. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Hyde. Would you like to sum up? Summed up. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh,
term myself for. A member that takes us to 15.10. Councillor Kouros, motion on notice, City of Adelaide Multicultural Community Hub. That council noting the success of the City of Melbourne model request administration to prepare a feasibility report on the benefits of the multicultural hub based in the City of Adelaide and identifies existing community assets that can be utilised for this purpose. And I have a secondary in the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Coros. Um, this is an excellent opportunity to utilise council assets in the north, central and south of the city to encourage immigrants to participate socially and culturally within the city. Um, this model has been successful, successfully used in the city of Melbourne and it would highlight as our city has been welcoming to all cultures. Um, it's also an opportunity to support our overseas students uh, to connect and seek support um, when uh, integrating the new city. Um, as a daughter of immigrants, I know how overwhelming it is coming to a new country and not knowing the language, the city, the culture. And this is an excellent initiative to give the ability to allow people to integrate uh, within our city and make friends, learn the language and give them ability on short courses. Um, this is a place where people from many different cultures can meet, work, share and learn in a safe environment that is managed and, and supervised. And since it's been successfully run for the past 10 years in Melbourne, it's a perfect um, model that we can draw from and implement within our city. And the beauty about it is that we can stretch it out throughout the whole of the city with the assets that we have. Thank you, Councillor Kouros, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, Councillor Sims. Last thing from me tonight, I promise, um, Lord Mayor. But I did um, want to commend Councillor Kouros for um, putting this forward. I think this is a great idea, um, a really great uh, initiative for our city. Um, we do have the Migration Museum at the moment that celebrates the story of migration um, in our city, which is terrific. Um, and um, we have a really proud story to tell. But um, this goes a step further in terms of uh, raising awareness of multiculturalism, providing opportunities for people to network and engage. And um, I think this would be a great addition to the city. Members? Councillor Kouros. Sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, members, motions without notice. There are none. Um, item 17 is exclusion to the public. Uh, so members, we've got uh, two confidential reports tonight. Um, if I can have a mover and a second of 18.1.1. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Abrahamson, and, and seconded by Councillor Knoll. Um, those in favour, 18.1.1. Thank you, that's carried. And I have a second, 18.2.1. Have Councillor Abrahamson and Councillor Knoll. Um, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, members of the gallery and staff, thank you for your attendance at this meeting. I mean, um, if you're not associated with item 18.1.1 or 18.2.1, uh, if you could now please leave the chamber while we consider these final items on the agenda. Thank you.
Thank you, members. Um, I call the meeting closed.